Welcome to our 2021 International LGMD Conference. I am Kat Bryant Knutson, and I serve as the conference administrator and am the founder of the Speak Foundation. This is our second conference for the entire limb girdle muscular dystrophy community. We are so excited as we have over 1,200 attending today. We have brought together the best researchers in the field, along with the leading biotech and pharma companies. We want to take a minute to thank our platinum sponsors, Sarepta Therapeutics, AskBio, and GFB Onless. I also welcome you to our conference this year. I'm Brad Williams, our conference chairman. Along with Carol Abraham and Kat Bryant Knutson, I live with a form of LGMD. Like many of you attending this conference, we understand the hardships of limb girdle muscular dystrophy and the hope of potential treatments. Our goals over the next four days is to educate and encourage you as there are many exciting things happening for LGMDs which we're eager to share with you. Welcome. My name is Carol Abraham and I also live with a diagnosis of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. I am proud to serve as our vice chair for the International LGMD Conference. Many diseases cause muscle weakness and difficulty walking. For most individuals, they have never heard the term limb girdle muscular dystrophy until they were in the diagnostic process. With there being more than 30 forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, it can be quite overwhelming to understand the diagnosis and disease process. In our first session, Overview of Limb Girdle Muscular Dystrophies, we are honored to have Dr. Volker Straub as our presenter. Dr. Straub is the director of Newcastle University's John Walton Muscular Dystrophy Research Center, a multidisciplinary center focusing on translational research in genetic neuromuscular diseases and the Patient Referral Center for Patients with Limb Girdle Muscular Dystrophy in the UK. Welcome, Dr. Straub. Hello, it's a great privilege for me to give the opening talk to the International Limb Girdle Muscular Dystrophy Conference, and I'd like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. I'm really delighted that the Lump Girdle Muscular Dystrophies have their own international conference now. In my talk, I'll provide you with an overview of Lump Girdle Muscular Dystrophies so that everyone is on the same page for the rest of the conference. I'd like to start with a disclosure statement which shows that I'm working very closely with industry. I'd also like to get a message across here that actually working together in a field of rare diseases is extremely important. And that includes patients, academics and clinicians, but also industry. So I think it's a good thing that I'm working with industry in rare diseases, also on lung girdle muscular dystrophies. For this specific talk, I don't think that there is a conflict of interest. Now, our center is located in the northeast of the United Kingdom of England. It's the John Walt Muscular Dystrophy Research Center at Newcastle, and Newcastle's at the River Tyne. There's a long-standing tradition, actually, to work on the diagnosis and care and research questions in limb girdle muscular dystrophies in Newcastle. And this tradition started with John Walton, who then became Lord Walton. And he actually plays an important role in limb girdle muscular dystrophies because he and his mentor, Frederick Natras, published a seminal paper on the classification, natural history, and treatment of the myopathies. And in this paper that was published in Brain, they first used and suggested the term limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And they referred to a group of genetic diseases that were characterized 
by four important features. They say that they usually show an onset in the first, second, or third decade of life, sometimes later. They show muscle weakness in their shoulder or pelvic girdle. The transmission is normally via an autosomal recessive gene, and the cause is relatively slow. So that's the first time limb girdle muscular dystrophies were actually defined. Now, in my talk, I'll talk a bit more about the definition of limb girdle muscular dystrophies, their genetics, their nomenclature, their symptoms, and their frequency. And then I will also focus a bit on what's new since the last limb girdle muscular dystrophy conference in Chicago in 2019. And then finally, we'll make a conclusion as well. So let's go back to the definition that we have already heard from John Walton. I think what's really important for everyone to understand what we mean by muscular dystrophy. And let's start with a skeletal muscle. So skeletal muscle is normally attached to bone by a tendon. It contains of muscle fiber bundles that we also call muscle fascicles. And those muscle fascicles are made of muscle cells or muscle fibers. So this is an individual muscle cell and fiber here. Now, many of you will have had a muscle biopsy in order to be diagnosed. And what normally happens with a biopsy is you look at the biopsy under a microscope and those long tube-like muscle cells or fibers if you do a cross section, they look not really like circles, but fairly homogeneous. Uh, and so what you see here is a normal muscle biopsy. Now, many of you may have never really looked at muscle before, but even the untrained eye can tell that this looks different to this. And this is what we define as muscular dystrophy, really. What you see is that, yes, there are some fibers that look very similar to the ones in normal muscle, but then there are a lot of other very small cells. This is inflammation. You can also see these white spots. This is fat, the pink stuff in between, which is connective tissue. The size of the muscle fibers varies from very small. These are regenerating new fibers, very large fibers. And then there are some that are damaged that really show that they um, are not functioning anymore. And ultimately, this all turns actually into an end stage picture of a muscular dystrophy where most of the muscle is replaced by fat. You can also see this if you put a patient with a progressive muscular dystrophy into an MRI scanner. So this is a boy here with a muscular dystrophy. And what you see here are cross sections through the thighs. Uh, so this is the left thigh and the right thigh, and this is a thigh bone. What's white is the subcutaneous fat. What's black is the bone. The bone marrow is also white and muscle is kind of darkish gray. And what you can see here over a course of 13 years is that the muscle basically shows the same color as fat. It becomes white and is replaced by fat. So another really important aspect that many of you will have heard is that within muscle fibers, we have many substances, molecules, proteins, as we call them. One of them is called creatine kinase. The function is not really relevant. But what happens in muscular dystrophy, it leaks out of damaged fibers, and therefore it is elevated in your blood levels. So there are a few key issues that define a muscular dystrophy. They are showing progressive muscle wasting, as illustrated here. There's primary damage of the muscle fibers, so the damage doesn't originate, for example, in the nervous system. They're normally high levels 
of creating kinase in the blood. Now, if the wasting of the muscles and the weakness that is associated with it affects your shoulder girdle muscles or your pelvic girdle muscles, we speak of a limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Now, the most common forms have been named by famous physicians like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and we don't call Duchenne muscular dystrophy a limb girdle muscular dystrophy, even though it shows all the features and characteristics that I have just listed. Now, there's one important aspect that I haven't really mentioned is all of these diseases are genetically determined. So we therefore need to look at genetics a bit, but it's less complex than you might think. Now, let's go back to the muscle and the muscle cell. Now, all cells in our body contain the entirety of our genetic information, and they contain this information on so-called chromosomes. These are the structures that are made out of DNA, and they can be seen a bit like a library or a bookshelf that contains a lot of genes, which are like the books. Genes are blueprints or recipes that provide the cell with the information how to make substances, which we call proteins, that are, that are important for the cell's function. So there's a circle and a flow of information from the gene to a protein that allows the cell to function. Now, the DNA is really just the chemistry of the genes. It's not really important that we focus on this. All you need to understand is that the DNA is encoding this information chemically, but it is basically a code of four letters. And these letters are A, T, G, and C. Now, the one thing that we often underestimate is how much information there is in our genome. And a genome is basically the complete set of genetic instructions that each cell contains. Now, the Wellcome Trust Collection did actually a fantastic effort by really writing down this entire code. And these are the numbers of the chromosomes, and it starts with one, and there's 22 chromosomes, and then there's an X and a Y chromosome. Now, we actually carry copies of these chromosomes in our cells. So there are always two copies. One comes from mom, one comes from dad. If you look at the information, it is actually one of the most boring books. I started with chromosome one, but didn't go much further actually, because it's just four letters in a specific order that defines who you are. What's really amazing is that two individuals are almost identical when it comes to these letters. And there's only one in a thousand letters that is different between two unrelated individuals. So there's a lot of information. Now these changes define our individual uniqueness. But if there are changes, they can also lead to a disease. The challenge often is to find what change is disease causing and which changes are just your unique makeup. Now, genetic changes when they occur can affect a inheritance and a disease in two ways. If you have an affected gene, so this is a genetic change, you can, despite the fact that you have an unaffected copy, still show symptoms, as in this affected father here or the affected mother here. So one of the gene copies is carrying a change, 
you show symptoms. Now, this means actually that the chance of your children to be affected is 50% because these genes are randomly transferred to the next generation. So it could either be the healthy or the, the faulty gene. We call this a dominant mode of inheritance. And again, an affected son or an affected daughter would have the same risk that each of their offspring, no matter whether male or female, would have a 50% chance to be affected. Now, we see this in lung fluid muscular dystrophies, but what we see more frequently is that if you have one genetic change and affect the gene here in dark blue again, you do not actually manifest any symptoms, but you are a so-called carrier. And it's when two carriers come together, which can happen, particularly if you are related or in ethnic groups, where again, people show closer relationships, and the genes are again randomly passed on to the next generation. And there's a chance of one in four or 25% of the kids to be affected. Now, this offspring will always have kids that are carriers, but because carriers are very rare, the partner will most likely be normal and therefore the chance of an affected patient in this case to have offspring that are affected in a recessive mode of inheritance is very small, unless you are closely related. Now, some of what I've just explained to you already explains also the nomenclature for the muscular dystrophies. And it was in 1995 that a workshop hosted by the European Neuromuscular Center decided to classify lung girdle muscular dystrophies according to their mode of inheritance. And they said, we will say lung girdle muscular dystrophy one to those that have an autosomal dominant mode of inheritance. So these are the ones that are actually rarer. And we will call LGMD two those with a recessive mode of inheritance. Those are the ones that are making up about 90% of all lung girdle muscular dystrophies. It's also important to point out that the CK levels are normally a lot higher in the ones that are LGMD2 or recessive than one or dominant. Now, what the workshop coordinators and participants didn't consider is that when they suggested to add a letter in the order of the discovery of the genes and the limb girdle muscular dystrophies, that they would at some time reach the end of the alphabet. And that happened a few years ago. So they started with LGMD 1A and 2A, and then went down to B, C, D, E, F. Uh, and many of you will be familiar with this classification and may have been provided with a diagnosis of, for example, LGMD 2I or 2B. Now, when we reached Z, we strongly felt we need to change something because it wasn't clear how to continue, but we knew that there were more patients with unclassified lung girdle muscular dystrophies. So what we did is we put another workshop together with experts in lung girdle muscular dystrophies, you can see some of them who will also participate in the conference as speakers, Carsten Bunnerman or Ivan Torrente here. We had patient representation. Here's Laura Rufibach from the Jane Foundation. Uh, we also had uh, experts for, for pediatric uh, lung girdle muscular dystrophies and for adult muscular dystrophies. And after basically two days behind locked doors, we came up with a new classification. Now, what we changed is that we said we should call the LGMD1 patients now LGMD D for autosomal dominant, and the LGMD2 patients R for autosomal recessive. And then we add a number in the order of discovery, 
And we would also list the protein or the substance that is affected by the genetic change. So formerly LGMD2A became LGMDR1 carbon related. So here at least we don't run into the problem that we are running out of numbers. We have by now also added new forms of muscular dystrophy, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, and we changed a few others. So my personal view, because I was involved, is that this is a more appropriate classification, but I should also point out that this is probably not the last word said. Uh, we are currently discussing, again, internationally, uh, whether this needs to be revised, uh, because there's an overlap also with other forms of muscular dystrophy. And currently, there's no optimal solution. But throughout my talk, I will refer to both the former and the new classification. Now, we have already mentioned the main symptom when we talked about the definition. Patients with limb girdle muscular dystrophy have limb girdle muscle weakness. So this is weakness of your shoulder girdles and your pelvic girdles. It can be difficult to lift up your arms. It can be difficult to walk upstairs or to get up from the floor. There are many other genetic muscle diseases and also those that are acquired, so not on a genetic base, that show limb girdle muscle weakness. And it can be difficult to distinguish those, even for an expert. Now, what's really important is that in addition to limb girdle muscle weakness, you may also show weakness of your respiratory muscles, and that can be problematic when it comes to, for example, chest infections or the need of ventilatory support. But the heart is also a muscle, and in some forms of limb girdle muscle dystrophy, the heart can be affected. So it's very important to know which form of muscular dystrophy, which specific form of limb girdle muscular dystrophy you have, so that your breathing function and your heart function can be monitored, or if you are affected by a form that doesn't involve the heart, for example, your clinician knows that there's no need to monitor your heart function. When it comes to the frequency of limb girdle muscular dystrophies, it's important to understand that all forms are rare diseases. All of them are, depending on the region, less than one patient in 100,000 of the population. Now I'm pointing out the region because it might depend on where you come from, which limb girdle muscular dystrophy you're most likely affected by. We have learned throughout the discovery of limb girdle muscular dystrophies that in certain regions, there's a higher frequency. This has actually been very helpful in classifying and characterizing limb girdle muscular dystrophies. And I've just listed a few publications here. There are many more. So, you know, limb girdle muscular dystrophy 2i, which is R9 now, is very frequent in Scandinavia, particularly in Denmark. Uh, there are others that are more frequent in Spain or in Croatia, and it depends on a specific genetic change. So for our region here in the northeast of England, it has been very crucial that we were invaded by the Vikings. And for those of you who know the Netflix series, The Last Kingdom, you're very much familiar with uh, the Vikings conquering the northeast of England. So in Newcastle, in our region here, we actually have many of the Viking genetic changes. And if a specific genetic change occurs frequently in a specific ethnic group, we call this a founder mutation. So the Vikings left their mutations here in Northumberland, in the northeast of England, and therefore certain forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy are more frequent in our region than there are in other regions of the world, particularly LGMD2I or R9, which we don't see in countries where the Scandinavian influence is very small, like, for example, in Japan. 
So there are, of course, larger studies that have been done, and I'm just showing you one here from North America, where uh, a large group of colleagues have worked together and look at more than 4,000 patients, and they found that LGMD2A or R1 caused by calpain 3 mutations, genetic changes, is the most common form, very closely followed by LGMD2B or now R2 caused by mutations in the dysferlin gene. And then there are other lymph girdle muscular dystrophies, LGMD2I, uh, which in North America, where there's a strong Scandinavian influence, can be found as well. Noctamin 5. Um, there are other patients, and I mentioned that Duchenne muscular dystrophy can present like a lymph girdle muscular dystrophy, also Becker muscular dystrophy, and they can be difficult to distinguish. That's why they're included in this LGMD test. But we have basically found uh, the same thing here in Europe. This is one of our studies in the MyoSeq project, which uh, looked at 2,000 patients across 50 sites in Europe. It was actually supported by a number of patient organizations, um, which we are very grateful for. And we also found that LGMD R1, or formerly 2A, caused by calpain 3, is the most common form, followed by this furlin anoctamin 5. We didn't see the LGMD 2I or R9 cohort um, as frequently in the MyoSeq project because many of these patients were already pre-tested and not involved. So with genetic testing, you can actually nowadays often avoid muscle biopsies as well and directly identify the patients through the genetic sequencing. I also want to point out that several of the lymph girdle muscular dystrophies are extremely rare, and you may only have one patient in a population of a million. So even the common ones are rare, but then there are many that are extremely rare. I want to now focus a bit on what's new since the last LGMD conference. And of course, all of us are most interested in seeing progress when it comes to treatments and patient care. But on the other hand, we also know that it's slightly frustrating that from a bright idea how to maybe treat a disease to ultimately have access to that treatment takes a long time. This is based on the fact that particularly the regulators want to make sure and governments that people are treated with safe and effective drugs. Now, one big challenge in rare diseases is that before you even start a clinical trial, you need to have some understanding about the natural progression of the disease and how to best actually assess patients in order to make sure that we know whether a drug works or not. So therefore, we are now in a situation where we fortunately start interventional trials, but where we are still doing observational studies. And this could be either through patient registries, and I would encourage everyone who hasn't registered in a lymph girdle muscular dystrophy registry, but knows his or her diagnosis to do so. And we are also doing a lot more natural history studies now. Now the, the difference again uh, depends on the, the number of patients. You can include thousands of patients if they are there in a patient registry or hundreds for interventional trials. You often have only a few patients. The data that you collect uh, need to be a lot more robust in interventional trials. So it's a lot more expensive. You need to spend more time. Um, but both patient registries and natural history studies are important to then move on to interventional trials. Now, why are natural history studies important? So these are studies that just look at the natural history of the disease, the natural cause. They are key to management and advice of you at a point in time of the patient. So that's really helpful. Um, but also, of course, 
It allows us to monitor longitudinal change. And it may provide comparative data for those receiving therapies later on. What's really extremely important for rare diseases as, as well is that it helps us to assess the way we assess patients. And you know, if necessary, then we need to adjust these assessment methods. Fortunately, in the past few years, the lymph girdle muscular dystrophy field has seen now a number of natural history studies for lymph girdle muscular dystrophy 2i or R9, for dysphalinopathy, for calpainopathies, for the sacroglycanopathies. And a huge role is playing the, the GRASP LGMD consortium. So, this is a consortium of trial sites, particularly in North America, but also in Europe, that have now initiated a number of natural history studies. And in those natural history studies, physiotherapists play a vital role because they are the ones who actually assess the patients. But we can also look at, for example, the MRI because it's non-invasive. Very rarely we now look at muscle biopsies because it's invasive and you can't do that repeatedly. I want to focus just briefly on one of the natural history studies that I'm involved as well uh, as the chief investigator and that is funded by the Jane Foundation. And this is the, the natural history study for patients with lymph girdle muscular dystrophy 2B or now R2 or dysphalinopathy. And these are sites that are currently enrolled in COS2. And COS2 is based on COS1, uh, which started several years ago, and it was an international clinical outcome study for dysphalinopathy funded by the Jane Foundation. And it assessed patients at six visits over three years at baseline at six months, 12 months, 24 months, and 36 months. And over those 14, 15 sites, we have enrolled more than 200 patients. Now, these are some of the assessments that were done, including you know, testing the breathing of the patients, but most of the uh, assessments were about your, your motor function. And I'm just mentioning this because this study has now allowed us to specifically develop an assessment for patients with lymph girdle muscular dystrophy. And it's called the North Star Assessment for lymph girdle type muscular dystrophies. So this is now an assessment that has been tested in a large cohort of patients and can be used for clinical trials. And I think you know, the exciting news in the field is that there are several companies, but also academic centers that are now developing interventional studies or have started interventional studies. And I've just listed a few here, Genethon in France, Sarepta in the US, Ask Bio as well. And then they have you know, PTC, MLD Biosolutions, Northwestern University here, Many other university and uh, academic centers are involved in these clinical trials. And I've just mentioned that we have now established one assessment method that can be used in these uh, clinical trials and in these interventions to see whether they are safe and whether they are effective. What is really important once you establish an assessment method to test an intervention is that your regulatory authorities that need to ultimately approve an intervention are also happy with that specific assessment method. Therefore, it's important to communicate with regulatory authorities early on. And again, it's exciting news that the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the US, has actually had a specific patient listening session of patients with LGMD. So these sessions allow early communication and inform the regulators about rare diseases, the concerns of the patients. And I was thrilled when I heard about this and it happened in 
October last year, that so many advocacy groups formed a consortium to coordinate this patient listening session with the FDA. I've listed the, the topics that were discussed. And again, I think this is important to raise awareness and to make sure that the patient needs are addressed when it comes to the clinical trials. And for the regulators also to understand, for example, appropriate assessment methods, as I've just mentioned. Now, often, as I already said, it takes a while before an effective and safe treatment is actually available and can be accessed by patients. But it doesn't mean that nothing else can be done before then. And so therefore, I'm showing you this slide about care standards. It's very important in rare diseases and it, the natural history studies help us to understand what kind of care can be provided. For example, when it comes to breathing problems, to heart problems, to motor problems, but also to problems with your gastrointestinal system, with specific wheelchairs or devices or photics that are needed. And uh, a few years ago, we at least published a recommendation for care standards for one of the limb girdle muscular dystrophies, but it wasn't really based on a lot of data. Now, registries are collecting a lot of data, and this is just the steering committee here for the Global FKP registry. It's also a way actually to communicate with patients, to publish newsletters. But based on the dysphelinopathy natural history state, uh, study, we have now applied for another European Neuromuscular Center workshop, also um, with support from the Jane Foundation to establish a standard of care recommendation for patients with dysphelinopathy because we have so many data now that we collected from the natural history studies. But this will serve as a template for many of the other limb girdle muscular dystrophies. So I've given you a general introduction and I hope that you now have an understanding about what we mean when we talk about limb girdle muscular dystrophies, that there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in the field, that a lot of things have happened over the past two years and so my conclusion would be, it is an exciting time to work in the field of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Make sure you have a precise diagnosis. Is this important? Yes, it's important for family planning. It's important for your own counseling, a choice of jobs, an understanding of your prognosis, uh, an understanding about prevention of complications. So these are the care standards. But it's really important now that we have started to do clinical trials to have a diagnosis because it's prerequisite to be included in a clinical trial and, of course, for future molecular therapies. My second conclusion, it's an exciting time to work in the field of lymphoma muscular dystrophy. Let's make sure we continue to work together. As Henry Ford said, coming together is a beginning, staying together is progress, and working together is success. Well, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you enjoy the International Limb Girdle Muscular Dystrophy Conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Straub. That was a very good overview of limb girdle. I want to just, just ask you a couple of questions. Um, one question I have, I think is just a, a good question for families. In terms of if a family member has a dominant inheritance pattern and they're concerned if their child perhaps may have inherited the disease from mom or dad, would you say like a quick test might be for them to have a CK done with that child? A lot of times genetic tests are costly. Sometimes people live in regions where they're, they're really unavailable. I know in the US and in the UK, they are readily available and most of the time they're free now. But in the case that maybe they weren't, what's your thought on maybe just doing a CK on that child to see if it's elevated? 
So I think what's, what's most important is to see the child, see whether there are any symptoms or signs that a clinician could detect. If there are concerns and the child doesn't show any symptoms, it then needs to be discussed with the family if they really want to do the test. I would fully agree that the CK can be an excellent screening test. In the dominant ones, it might be a bit more difficult to really make a strong prediction if the CK is low. If it's high, then you have a good indicator that the child might be affected. Most importantly, I think you need to have that discussion with the family. What do they want to know? Um, and to also assess the child in combination. Yeah, right, because a lot of times, even in recessive forms, the CK levels can be elevated a lot. So it might be another way to approach checking to see if your other kids are affected. For example, if you have one child that comes up affected and you have other children that are younger, it might be a good idea to, to check that way versus getting another genetic test. Um, it's a hard decision for families though, right? It is, a, it is a difficult decision. That's why I think it's so important and I emphasize that the counseling, that the family needs to know what to expect, either if a test result isn't clear or if it's clearly indicating that the child is affected. Um, we all always hope that the test shows that a child is not affected. And again and again, I have experienced that families are sometimes poorly prepared if the diagnosis is then confirmed. So therefore, I just want to make sure that you don't do a CK screening easily without having the discussion and consultation. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Um, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the nomenclature change. I think for others so that they can understand it very easily, the best way I could describe it from a layman's perspective is to kind of think of the R and the D as designating dominant and recessive. I think that was great the way you put it. And that the number is the number in terms of how the gene was discovered. So, so R1 would be the first discovery and that would correspond with the first mutation for limb girdle and when it was located and discovered. Am I correct in how I just said that? Um, yes, and thank you very much for trying to really simplify it and make it easy. Now, there's always a more complex academic background um, and it is strange, but the LGMD R1 or 2A wasn't actually the first one where genetic change was discovered. At that time, it was really just the identification of the location of the gene. Um, the very first limb girdle muscular dystrophy where a mutation was discovered was LGMD 2D. Um, this is alpha sarcoglycan in 1994. But uh, that's the academic uh, complicated discussion. You're absolutely right. R for recessive, D for dominant. And then the, the numbers are in the order of the discovery of the disease. Okay. So as you get you know, later on the numbers, that means that the gene was discovered later. That's absolutely correct. And so with the latest numbers, we are now down to 26. Some of these limb girdle muscular dystrophies were only very recently in the, in the past couple of years described. Thank you so much, Dr. Straub. Okay. And um, it's nice working with you and we'll see you soon, okay? Looking forward to the whole conference. Hey everyone, my name is Eric Hershley and I have limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2B. Um, first off, I just want to say how honored I am to be speaking with all of you today and uh, it, what a privilege it is to share my story with you. My muscular dystrophy story, dystrophy story started about 10 years ago, but I had no idea. Um, growing up, I was a pretty normal kid. I played 
a lot of competitive sports, whether it be in baseball, um, basketball, golf, football. I also spent a lot of times in the woods, hunting, fishing, you know, pretty normal um, lifestyle for a kid. Um, at the age of 15, I did start to notice um, an increase or a decrease in my running speed. Um, I had grown like six inches that year and um, it really it looked like I was running in slow motion. My arms would shuffle really quickly, but my legs would just like take forever to catch up. Um, my parents and I, we really didn't think much of it because I had grown so much. Um, I just really wasn't used to my body yet, but um, little did we know we were definitely wrong. Um, that same year, I ended up having my first rotator cuff surgery at the age of 15, um, which eventually led me to not play baseball anymore. Um, but even then, I still didn't have really any issues until about the age of 18. And I started having issues that really nobody should should have at that age. Um, my hip and my balance was just like really off. My hip pain was through the roof. I could hardly get upstairs. I couldn't stand on my tiptoes at all. Um, so I decided to go ahead and make an appointment with my orthopedic surgeon, um, just see what was going on. Of course, I was 18. So I I thought I had it all figured out. You know, I, I tore my hip labrum uh, for playing baseball those years and I just needed that fix. And I'd be on my way. Well, that turned into orthopedic surgeon after orthopedic surgeon after orthopedic surgeon. Nobody could really figure out what's wrong. I think it took three or four MRIs. They were doing my back, my hip, you know, anything in that vicinity. But um, they finally decided that they wanted to go ahead and send me to a rheumatologist. And once I figured out what a rheumatologist was, I realized, well, at this point, I'm 19. I probably don't have arthritis. So I knew that probably wasn't it. But till this day, I am super thankful that I was sent to her because she was the first person, the first specialist to really um, dive a little deeper into my case and uh, really review. She, she did an actual physical on me and she could tell from my legs that something wasn't quite right. So she ordered a lab test that day. Um, we got the lab test and she immediately referred me to a neurologist. And I, at this point, I'm really confused. I think I'm about 20 years old. Um, I don't really know what's going on, but I am happy that I'm headed in the right direction. It seems um, I went and saw the neurologist and as all of us know, he revealed that my CPK levels were very high up over an 8,000. Um, and he said that is an early sign of muscular dystrophy. And at the time I was 20 and I had no idea what muscular dystrophy was, which is, you know, kind of, you know, I, it's embarrassing to say now, but I was 20 years old. Like, wh why would I know, I guess? And, um, he told me what it was. So I, you know, I started asking questions like, all right, what's the cure? What medicine do I take? And he, you know, those questions got a very complicated answer and it, it led to a lot of a lot of tears and sadness, but um, he, he kind of gave my options about where to head next and what kind of testing I had to go through. And um, he sent me a referral to Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And he said if I stayed in Kansas City, it would take months to almost years to get diagnosed. And I thought that was just crazy and not really an option because, I mean, again, I'm 20 years old and I, I don't want to just wait around for a couple more years to, to figure out my diagnosis. I want to get this thing rolling. So um, I ended up going to Mayo Clinic, um, and that was really the best decision my parents and I had ever made during this whole process because I ended up staying a total of seven days, and there were some long days, you know, six to eight procedures a day, 10 to 12 hours a day. It, it was really an exhausting experience, but um, I went to Mayo uh, in February, and that same year in April, I was diagnosed with limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And I want to go into that day a little bit because I knew I already had muscular dystrophy just because of all the, the talk and everything that I was hearing. But um, it really hit home that, that day reading that message and my parents at home. And they, they told me, you know, like my mom really told me, she said, you know, step it up. You know, it, you can be sad now, but you're going to kick this thing's butt. You know, you're going to get on with that. And it turns out she knows me pretty well because now I've... Uh, I started off doing, you know, just local MDA stuff, um, working with them closely on local fundraisers, speaking at public events, um, creating my own muscle walk team. And then I started doing my own events um, with one of my 
one of the guys from MDA, he helped me out do a poker event. And I remember the exact amount we raised $575. And I just felt amazing. You know, it felt so good just to give back to, to our community and people like us. And it was, it was really rewarding. And um, I, I haven't stopped then. I mean, last year during COVID, NBA was shut down. During all that mess, we um, one of the guys who actually is no longer with the NBA still helped me with a golf tournament, and that was super awesome. And we uh, we successfully did it with the help of the Speak Foundation and my friends and family, and we raised over uh, four thousand dollars, which was awesome. It was really really great. Um, and we're going to we're going to have another tournament coming up in September. We kind of try to plan it with um, the National Awareness Day. So that's pretty cool. But um, nowadays, I, I mean, I live a, a fairly normal life. I, uh, I have a beautiful girlfriend and we got th- we have three kids together. We just um, welcomed a newborn baby girl um, actually back in August. So that was awesome. Um, but I still um, I still do things I love. I barbecue with family. I still golf. I coach competitive basketball and I do all that fun stuff. Still, I think it's important that we still do what we love, you know, as best as we can. But during this whole speech, I've kind of highlighted some, some good times and bad times, but I definitely want uh, everybody to know that I'm here for you and um, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to be frustrated with this disease. Um, We, we know exactly what the other person's going through and nobody else does, but it's just, we just got to stick together. I mean, you guys are my brothers and sisters, and uh, I just want to be here for you all and continue to fundraise and spread awareness for people like us. That's all I got today. And um, I just appreciate you listening to me and hearing my story and you guys all stay strong. Sarepta is a global biotechnology company on an urgent mission to engineer precision genetic medicine for rare diseases that devastate lives and cut futures short. Our mission is that Sarepta is armed with the most advanced science in genetic medicine. We are in a daily race to rescue lives otherwise stolen by rare disease. At Sarepta, every day is another 24 hours to stand up for patients, advance technology, challenge convention, and drag tomorrow into today. Sarepta Therapeutics is proud to be a platinum level sponsor of the LGMD conference this September, 2021. We are so excited to be part of this event and present to the patient community about our work. We chose to focus on the most common forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy to start, which encompasses about 70% of the limb girdle population. And that is LGMD 2A, 2B, 2C, 2D, 2E, and 2L. During my fellowship training, I started studying limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Uh, There was a need for treatment for patients with limb girdle muscular dystrophy, and the genes were just starting to be identified. And so it was an opportune time to be able to research uh, the disease, identify potential gene therapy treatments. There are three main components to gene therapy, uh, and the first is your capsid. And what that is is just a simple way to deliver the gene throughout the body. It's like a little shuttle to carry your gene there. The second part is your gene itself. This is the gene that is missing or mutating the disease, and we're just delivering a normal copy um, back to the cells. And the third, which is an important part of the component, is called a promoter. And what this does is just regulate how that gene is turned on. We see many more patients being diagnosed Specifically, they know their subtype of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And this is important because each of these is caused by a different gene. And in order to develop a specific therapy for that disease, you need to know the gene responsible. Before, during, and after the conference, we encourage the patient community to visit limbgirdle.com for community resources, including information about genetic testing. If you also wish to connect to somebody from our team, you can email us directly at advocacy at U.S. patients who wish to receive updates are also able to add their information at limbgirdle.com slash stay connected, and you can follow us on our social media channels.
Hi, I'm Kat Bryant Knutson. I wanted to share with you that I was diagnosed with LGMD type 2i in 2006. At that time, there were very few resources for limb girdle. So in 2008, I founded the Speak Foundation to specifically help those living with muscular dystrophy. The one thing I knew is that we needed a way to communicate to everyone in this vast community. So we started the LGMD Patient Network. It is the first patient-led registry for all forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. The LGMD Network is for any individual to join. And when you join, you receive a free subscription to the world's only LGMD News Magazine. The magazine brings together researchers, clinicians, and pharmaceutical companies all in one place. We've teamed up to give you the best information that is the latest news for the LGMDs. If you haven't joined our network, please sign up at thespeakfoundation.com. Thank you. Welcome back from our short break. In this segment, updates on clinical trials and emerging treatments, we have Dr. Nick Johnson, Dr. Peter Kang, Dr. Katherine Matthews, and Dr. Tasheen Mosafar. All are members of the GRASP LGMD Consortium. Today, they will be sharing information about emerging treatments and updating the community on clinical trials. Let's listen in. Hi, I'm Jennifer Levy. I'm the Scientific Director for Coalition to Cure Calpain 3, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Updates on Clinical Trials and Emerging Treatments session of the International Limb Girdle Muscular Dystrophy Conference. We have four expert speakers who are going to explain what clinical trials are, talk about some emerging treatments for LGMDs, and discuss how you can get involved. So our first speaker today is Dr. Peter Kang, a pediatric neurologist at the University of Minnesota, Professor and Vice Chair of Research in the Department of Neurology and Director of the University of Minnesota Wellstone Muscular Dystrophy Center. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Levy, and many thanks to the organizers of this wonderful conference for the invitation to speak. So I will be talking about a framework for participating in research, and this will help lead into the other speakers today. So uh, why do we want to participate in research? Uh, next slide, please. So my disclosures uh, of current and recent include some research funding from the CDC, NIH, ML Bio Solutions, and some work for Sarepta Therapeutics and Avexis Novartis. Next slide, please. So what is a clinical trial? That's a term that's used a lot now in the limb girdle muscular dystrophy world. And there's a lot of excitement about clinical trials that are either open or pending. So a clinical trial is a research study that looks at whether a particular new treatment is safe and effective. And those are two key words, safe and effective. In the United States, clinical trials are supervised by the Food and Drug Administration, often called the FDA. Now, the safety and effectiveness or efficacy of a new treatment are often divided up into different trials called phases based on specific FDA requirements. It's important to think about natural history studies. These are not specifically part of clinical trials, but they can be very important in terms of contributing to clinical trials. So a natural history study collects data on how a disease evolves over time. And you'll hear a lot more about natural history studies from one of our speakers coming up. Sometimes a natural history study is needed to establish the baseline parameters before a clinical trial can be performed. So that's one of the reasons why natural history studies can be really important in terms of not only understanding a disease, but developing new treatments. Next slide, please. So there are four formal phases of clinical trials in the process of FDA approval. And some of you may have heard about these terms because some of the trials are labeled explicitly as such, phase one, two, three, et cetera. So phase one is a small study that focuses on safety and dosage range, and it's typically the first time a new treatment's been tried in humans. And sometimes you use healthy volunteers, and sometimes you actually use a small group of patients from the disease population. It depends a lot on the actual setting. 
A phase two is when you start to expand and, and each of these phases is sequential, meaning if you do well in one, then you move on to the next. So when you get to phase two, you're doing a larger study of safety with a little bit of efficacy data. And then by the time you get to phase three, this is sometimes referred to as the pivotal study because this is the phase that gets you ready for FDA approval. This is typically an even larger study which focuses on efficacy and monitoring of adverse reactions. Is this new treatment something that's suitable to be released to the public? And between phase three and phase four is when typically the FDA approval process takes place. Phase four is where you do post-approval studies. Even after approval, we might find something new, some new information that's helpful to know about a new treatment. And so it's important to do a phase four study as well so that we can continue to learn from our experiences. Next slide, please. So how do I find clinical trials? If you're a patient or a patient's family and you, you hear that there are clinical trials going on, how do I find them? Well, I'll, I'll go through step by step. You should first talk to your healthcare provider, physician, nurse practitioner, genetic counselor, uh, the people that you are relying on to give you information. There are numerous foundations and patient organizations that are very important for these diseases, and they are also authoritative sources of information. A very official source of information is clinicaltrials.gov, which is a website that I'll explain in more detail in a minute. Next slide, please. So your healthcare provider, so you should ask your physician or other healthcare provider about any trials that you've heard about online or through other sources and just get their perspective. And not everybody knows everything, but it's important to get more information, gather information from multiple sources. You can also ask your healthcare provider whether their center offers any clinical trials for your condition. Large referral centers such as academic hospitals are often sites for such clinical trials. Next slide, please. So there are foundations and patient organizations that are really important sources of information. Uh, the Speak Foundation is a good one, the Muscular Dystrophy Association, Coalition to Cure Calpain 3, also known as C3, the Jane Foundation, and there are many others. So this is not by any means an exhaustive list, but also but just a list of examples. Next slide, please. So the clinicaltrials.gov website is an important resource to be aware of. And it's open and available to the public. So um, healthcare providers look them up, scientists look them up, and patients and their families are certainly welcome to look at this website. It's supported by the National Institutes of Health, a branch of the US government. It includes studies that are both based in the United States and overseas. And what you can do is you can type limb girdle muscular dystrophy or whatever disease that you're interested in into the conditioner or disease box that is on the website's homepage. So when I recently did a search under limb girdle muscular dystrophy, I pulled 41 studies. Now, one thing that's important to keep in mind is these studies are not all clinical trials or treatment trials. The clinicaltrials.gov website has become a large umbrella for gathering a lot of clinical research studies. So some of these are observational studies, natural history studies, as well as clinical trials. There are, there are also some studies that are active and some studies that are not active, meaning that they're not enrolling patients. So it does mean that you have to go through and look at the, the fine print carefully that's listed for each study. And then if it seems like they're enrolling and you might be eligible and you're interested, you can then contact the contact person who is listed on that website. It is a good idea if you hear about a study to verify that it's listed on this website before seriously considering participation Listing on clinicaltrials.gov is not a full guarantee of safety, but if a group has gone to the trouble to list it on this website, it means that they're pretty serious. And especially if you're talking about treatments that they're serious about going through the FDA approval process. Next slide, please. So there are questions that you might want to ask before signing up for a study. One is, is this a treatment trial or a natural history study? And both are very worthy investigations, and you just want to know what exactly it is that you'll be experiencing. Will you be given a new treatment, or will you be mostly monitored and tested for, for what the symptoms are and complications? 
what are the potential risks and benefits to participation, especially if it is a treatment clinical trial and you're being given a new drug or a new treatment? What, what should you potentially anticipate in terms of potential side effects or risks that are known to the investigators? Another question is, are there any invasive procedures such as muscle biopsies involved? And muscle biopsies can be very helpful for gathering information about the disease process. And I have participated in studies where we've had to do muscle biopsies and they can be very, very important procedures to go through. And, um, and we greatly appreciate it when, when patients are willing to undergo muscle biopsies. You do want to know what you're getting into though. And so it's important to ask about these kinds of procedures. How many study visits are required? And especially if you live a little bit far away from the study site, do you have to keep going back and forth? Is it a long drive or even a plane flight that's gonna be required on a regular basis? And so you'll want to think about travel plans, especially if you live a little far from the study site. Ideally, all or most of the answers to these questions should be on the consent form that you're given a chance to review. But you should always feel comfortable asking for clarification. And it's really important for your questions to be answered before you sign up for a study, whether it's a natural history study or a treatment trial. Next slide, please. So a few take home points. In a clinical trial, there is potential benefit for the study participant, but it is important to remember the main goal of the study is to answer questions for the benefit of a larger group of patients with the disease. Second take home point is that studies that do not offer potential treatments are often critical to paving the way for studies that do have this potential. So your participation in studies like natural history studies make a big difference. You are integral members of the teams that develop new therapies for muscular dystrophy and we greatly value your participation and your sacrifices. We know that it's not easy for patients to participate in these trials. They give up time. They sometimes make effort to travel. And so we, we always try to express our appreciation, but I just wanted to put out there how grateful we all are for your considering such participation and your contributions to this effort. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to participate in the panel discussion at the end. Thank you, Dr. Kang. Our next speaker is Dr. Tajin Mosafar. He is a neurologist at University of California in Irvine. He's a professor of neurology, orthopedic surgery, pathology, and laboratory medicine, as well as interim chair of neurology. Thank you, Dr. Levy. Um, it's my real pleasure to um, discuss natural histories and registries in limb girdle muscular dystrophies. Um, and I think Dr. Kang did a very good job of introducing the subjects, as well as introducing the website with, uh, of clinicaltrials.gov, which is an important resource to find some of these studies. Um, in clinical trials, we have um, various disclosures. I, my research work has been funded by the NIH um, through both the NINDS and NIAMS, but we also do a lot of clinical trials and that um, uh, is listed here, uh, as well as advising um, for different pharmaceutical companies on various neuromuscular topics. Um, uh, I want to start with registries. Um, a patient registry is not a, um, a formal study. It is a collection of set of data um, that gets organized and it's available for other researchers um, to, to build their studies on. Um, so it's a starting point for um, some of the studies. A registry is continuous. This usually doesn't have a defined uh, end date. So the registry can keep going on, whereas natural histories are usually have a defined starting point and a, defi a defined ending point on this. Um, some of the information that is collected in a registry may be the same data that is collected in a natural history study, but there are differences, and I'll cover that when I get to the natural history studies. Um, uh, registries can be done from patients' home. It doesn't always require travel. Um, so it's, um, it's open-ended as to how the patients can participate. Um, and there are patient reported outcomes and information about their diagnosis and, uh, and sometimes details about the genetic diagnosis that are collected as part of a registry. 
Um, but most of these information are patient reported and they are th therefore considered subjective. And then there is an element of recall bias. So some of the question is, when did your disease start? For instance, um, the patient may have a different um, recollection than what actually happened uh, in this case. So those are some of the limitations with the registry, but these are um, the ongoing patient registries right now. This is a, a comprehensive website um, that lists all of the international limb girdle patient registries. And each, uh, pretty much each of the limb girdle muscular dystrophies have uh, their own registry. Um, so this is an incredible resource. I would uh, strongly encourage you to look at this website, go to individual registry, uh, which is relevant to your disease. Uh, and consider participating uh, in these registries. As Dr. Kang mentioned, these studies, which are not necessarily um, treatment-related uh, studies or um, interventional studies, still provide very valuable information and help us understand more and more about your disease. Next slide. I'm gonna to switch to natural history studies. The natural history studies are observational studies. So they um, observe disease behavior and disease progression um, in a prospective fashion. Uh, uh, and it tries to observe, in my opinion, three primary things. Now, the first is if the rate of progression, which often um, usually in a disease like limb girdle muscular dystrophy means worsening, is that rate of progression uniform or is it different in different set of patients? And, and what are the factors that may be influencing the disease progression? Is it the particular genetic mutation? And we know that certain uh, gene mutations are more aggressive and certain gene mutations tend to predict a milder um, disease. Are there other factors such as concurrent diseases such as diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiac involvement, are the medications that may influence the disease progression? And, and age, does the disease behave differently if you get it at a younger age? Does the disease behave differently if you get it um, at an older age? Um, but I, I, one of the questions that we often try to answer, and especially in um, diseases that are slow progressive, um, and with, with keeping in mind that we may be thinking about um, experimental drug trials or gene therapies is, is the question that is the measurable change in disease larger enough in a six month period or a one year period to see a, to predict a difference in treatment groups in a clinical trial? Um, is, it, is it too small to, to be able to be appreciated or is it large enough that you can do a short clinical trial and get a straight answer? Next. Similarly, we often use the um, natural history study to uh, uh, figure out which is the best measure of disease progression. Um, and, and, and again, these measures will be used in clinical trials to show effectiveness of a drug. Um, and especially in the case of treatment, this measure should be responsive not only to disease worsening, but should also be responsive to disease improvement. So one good example of that is the use of North Star in the ongoing LGMD RASP study. Um, North Star is an um, outcome measure that was developed for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but we have now adopted it for limb girdle muscular dystrophies. And so far, um, as far as we can tell, um, it's functioning, it's working very well in limb girdle muscular dystrophies. Um, active limb is another such measure. Um, you, we, uh, you can look at whether we should be doing the traditional six-minute walk test versus the newer, um, shorter two-minute walk test, um, muscle measurements, various types of muscle measurements. And then often natural history studies allows us an opportunity to develop a patient-reported outcome measure, especially if one does not already exist uh, in the space. Next. Um, and then... It, it gives us a unique opportunity to, to test and validate disease-related biomarkers um, that can then be used to follow disease progression, um, to diagnose the disease, um, and understand uh, treatment-related responses. 
So examples of such biomarkers include magnetic resonance imaging of skeletal muscles that is increasingly being used in muscle disorders, where you're looking at the volume of muscle, um, any um, replacement with fat in skeletal, skeletal muscle, and then you can calculate fat fractions or changes in signals within the muscle that may suggest um, edema or swelling of the muscle or inflammation of the muscle. Uh, muscle biopsy is another biomarker where you can look at not only protein staining, you can also quantitate the protein of interest such as uh, dystrophin or dysferlin um, in various muscular dystrophies. But then you can look at other biomarkers. So for instance, in the ongoing study um, of uh, limb girdle uh, R9, we are looking at um, uh, surface glycation uh, as a biomarker for be, to be used in future trials. And then elect electrical impedance myography is another biomarker that we have used uh, in the past and in some of the ongoing studies. Um, next slide. So there are a number of ongoing um, natural history studies in um, limb girdle muscular dystrophy space. And um, I've taken this list from those 41 um, studies that Dr. Kang mentioned. Uh, they are all listed on clinicaltrials.gov. And I, I would re-emphasize Dr. Kang's point that if a, a researcher has taken the trouble of listing it on clinicaltrials.gov, that means that the rigor and, and the precision of that um, study is good. Um, and they have taken into consideration all the safety factors. Um, and, and those are the kind of studies that you probably want to participate in. Um, so the, this list includes both US-based studies as well as studies that are currently being run in, in Europe, China, and the Russian Federation. Um, the, the, some of the um, big ones are the LGMD graph study, which is the number, number three uh, on this list, as well as the number five study, which is the biomarker study through the LGMD graph. Um, Jane Foundation has a large um, longitudinal study in uh, limb girdle 2B that's been going on for many years and has already um, yielded um, many research papers um, with very valuable information. And then the uh, Dr. Matthews group in Iowa um, has an interest in limb girdle muscular dystrophy with dystroglycan defects um, covering um, all the muscular dystrophies that have defect. And that's been going on for about 15 years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mosafar. Our next speaker is Dr. Katherine Matthews, a pediatric neurologist at the University of Iowa. She's a professor of pediatrics and neurology, as well as the director of the Iowa Neuromuscular Program and Muscular Dystrophy Clinic. Thank you, Jen, and thank you um, to the organizers for inviting me to participate. So I was asked to talk about the um, treatment possibilities for FKRP-related limb girdle muscular dystrophy, so LGMD2IR9. Um, next slide, please. Um, as my fellow speakers uh, do, I have a number of disclosures. I have research funding from um, both industry and from um, federal agencies like the NIH. Um, serve on scientific advisory boards and a uh, FARA board member. So no personal compensation for any of these activities. Next slide, please. So um, the FKRP related limb girdle, um, limb girdle muscular dystrophy has several attractive features and you've sort of heard some of these already, but um, when considering um, treatments. So and maybe one of the reasons that we're a little bit farther along in um, the treatment pathway on this disease. So first of all, FKRP is a very small gene. Um, so it's um, easy to consider modifying it or replacing it. The um, metabolic pathway that it plays a role in has been increasingly well understood over the last about five years. Um, and it's among the, as you all know, rare limb girdles, it's relatively common. So it accounts for about 10% of limb girdle muscular dystrophy in, in most series. And um, there are um, natural history studies and registries both here and in Europe that are established and have collected quite a lot of information. So it's feasible to plan trials. Next slide, please. Um, we do have some experience in um, LGMD2IR9 um, trials. So there are 
um, two studies that have closed. There was a myostatin inhibitor study. This is a, a um, group of, of molecules that was designed to make muscles larger, basically. Um, and it was not shown to be effective in 2i in a clinical trial. Um, there was also a steroid trial that was closed due to insufficient enrollment. And I mentioned that um, that's an important thing. These are all the limb, each specific limb girdle muscular dystrophy is a rare disease. So we have to be very thoughtful about how we design trials to maximize the information from each patient. And as um, previous speakers have mentioned, we are very grateful to the um, contributions of patients and families in participating. There are two studies that are in development or in early phase trials. Um, those are a ribotol study and gene replacement. So I'm going to go talk a little tiny bit more about each of those as examples of potential therapies that are um, close to trials. Next slide. So this is a little bit of a daunting pathway, but for those of you who are not familiar with the FKRP related muscular dystrophies, um, the, I, I said that we know a lot about the pathway. So the basic problem with the FKRP related muscular dystrophies and the other dystroglycanopathy related muscular dystrophies is that um, there is a deficiency of a long sugar molecule that um, provides stability to the muscle cell membrane. So if there's a deficiency of this sugar molecule, the muscle cell membrane doesn't have appropriate stability, breaks down, and you can have, and you have loss of muscle fibers. The long sugar molecule that I mentioned is shown in this diagram as the circles and squares and stars and multicolored. Those are different kinds of sugar molecules that need to be put on alpha dystroglycan in a sequential order. And each of those sugar molecules has a special enzyme that is required to put that sugar molecule on in the proper order. And those are identified by in this diagram by the uh, series of letters and numbers that are in purple. So up toward the um, right uh, hand top corner of this um, diagram, you see FKRP and FKTN, and you can see the word CDP ribotol. So what FKRP does is it takes CD CDP ribotol and it attaches it to the growing long sugar molecule um, that is required for muscle cell membrane stability. So the concept of this, this um, small molecule therapy, the ribotol therapy that is under development, is that if you give a whole bunch of ribotol to somebody, first of all, let me go back and say one other thing, that everybody has some FKRP activity. So we believe that if you have no FKRP activity, you probably never get to be a human being. You never are born. So everybody has some FKRP activity. So the concept here is, can we make that residual FKRP activity work harder? So can we give extra ribotol and push that FKRP to make more of that whole, um, the, to add more to the growing sugar chain and thus increase the stability of the membrane and slow or prevent disease progression. And there's work in mice that says that, yes, this is um, a promising approach to therapy. Um, so there is a phase two trial that is currently ongoing. And um, I think the, the expectation is that this will move into a phase three trial within the next year. So this is an example of a small molecule that is given orally to try to address the metabolic pathway involved in the disease. Next slide. So the other um, um, option for, for potential therapy in LGMD 2i R9 is gene replacement. Now, Dr. Johnson is going to talk at length about, about gene replacement, so I won't dwell on this too much, but I will give a little bit of information here. So gene replacement, 
the, the gene is generally packaged inside a modified virus. It's given as an IV infusion. And with our current state of knowledge and management, it can only be given once. And there are a number of companies that are exploring gene replacement into IR9. And we believe that there's a good likelihood that at least one of those will be um, moving into early phase human clinical trials within the next year. I do want to note that um, you know, gene replacement seems straightforward. Gene missing, put it in a virus, put it back in the cells. Um, there is only one genetic disease with FDA approved gene replacement for systemic delivery so far, and that's for children with spinal muscular atrophy, a different kind of disease um, under age two. So it's obviously not quite as straightforward as we think, and Dr. Johnson will cover that in more detail. Next slide. Um, there are a couple of considerations I wanted to mention with regard to gene replacement for FKRP-related muscular dystrophy. One it has to do with dosage. So um, we know that there are human diseases in which you can have, if you have too much um, of, a, of a gene or a protein, you have a disease. And if you have too little, you have a disease. And so with any gene therapy, you wonder if I if I give too much of a gene, am I going to cause a problem? Um, and there is some limited mouse evidence that suggests that perhaps too much FKRP could be harmful. So it's something that, that um, in developing studies, we need to think about um, if, whether or not there's a potential for causing harm. And then FKRP-related muscular dystrophy is one of the disorders that does involve the heart. So we always wonder whether the heart is, is targeted by the gene um, therapy or any other, other treatment. And again, Dr. Johnson will cover those things in more detail. Next slide. There are other approaches to therapy that are being explored in animal or cell models. These are very preclinical, but just to let people know that there are other approaches besides the, the ones that I've mentioned. So there are other small molecules or drugs that have not, that um, have been developed for other purposes that are under study. The gene therapy, there are different approaches to gene therapy. The most straightforward is um, a modified viral vector and put the missing gene back in, but there can be other genes in the pathway that might be helpful, or there are different vectors, different ways to package a gene that could be explored. And finally, there's, there's still some work going on in cell-based therapies where you infuse a cell into humans or inject a cell into humans to try to improve the disease process. Um, these are approaches that are currently in, as I said, very early stages. They may or may not ever move to a trial, but it's important to know that there are things, other things being explored. Next slide. So to sort of summarize FKRP-related therapy development, we've had some studies that have ended without leading to a treatment, and that's true in every disease. We always have studies that don't lead to a treatment. But with every study that, that people participate in, we learn something more about the disease. We learn something more about how to design a trial. So the scientific community learns something from every trial, even if it doesn't lead to a treatment. Um, and, and it does help advance the, the um, knowledge that allows us to develop a, a treatment that does work. So again, when you enter a trial, um, understand that it may or may not lead to a treatment, but that you are benefiting the, the scientific community and you are leading um, to better treatments for your disease, even if the specific trial doesn't succeed in generating an FDA approved treatment. In FKRP related LGMD, there are some approaches that are um, close to phase three clinical trials. Um, and there are other potential treatments that are under development. So it is really exciting to have a pipeline. So to have things at different stages of development and know that we're making progress. And because this is a, um, a large community, I wanted to make sure that people recognize that progress in any one form of LGMD can honestly benefit the whole community. The, the 
Um, people who fund studies see that, that we can make progress in this group of diseases, and that's important for the whole community. So I think I'll end with that, and thank you for your attention, and uh, I look for the, forward to the panel discussion. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Our final speaker is Dr. Nicholas Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a neurologist at Virginia Commonwealth University. He's an associate professor and division chief of neuromuscular and vice chair of research in the Department of Neurology. Thanks, Jen. Uh, and I'm excited to be a part of this panel today. Uh, thanks again to uh, the Speak Foundation for organizing everything. So you've heard uh, a little bit from uh, Dr. King about kind of research over one, how to participate. Uh, from Dr. Mosavar about a uh, number of the ongoing natural history studies that provide the foundation. Um, and then from Dr. Matthews about um, um, speaking about, you know, where LGMD R9 is because it's got a diversity of treatment options. I'm going to take the last little bit of our time here um, to talk about gene therapies and limb girdle muscular dystrophy, which is really the frontier of um, therapeutic development across the limb girdle muscular dystrophies. We can go to the next slide. Uh, so these are my disclosures. I've received research funding from the NIH, FDA, CDC, a number of patient uh, foundations, uh, pharmaceutical companies, and I provided consultation or advice to a number of different pharmaceutical companies and received royalties from patient reported outcomes. Go to the next slide. So what is gene therapy? Um, I mean, we talk a lot about it, so we're going to take some time kind of understanding it, understanding the um, kind of fundamentals of it so that you're able to speak with your physician and the clinical trialist who is engaging the research and have an um, intelligent conversation about the pros and cons and, and how far we think this can take us. So gene therapy um, really at its fundamental stage is taking a viral vector, it's taking out all of the bad viral DNA um, or RNA and putting in um, human DNA or RNA. So that's at the end of the day, that's that's what gene therapy is. So, well, why do we use gene therapy? Well, it turns out viruses are really good at penetrating cells. They've had thousands of years of evolution to figure out how to get into human cells and propagate efficiently. That's, uh, so we're making use of that evolutionary biology. And they can really package almost any DNA or RNA. There are some caveats with that. We're gonna talk about what that means, uh, but really, you can put any sequence into those viral vectors and deliver it into human cells. Next slide. So what are, what are the components? And I'm gonna spend time talking about AEB vectors because uh, by and large, that is, that is really where the community is settled in terms of what our viral vector is gonna be um, for delivering the gene therapy um, uh, in multiple different forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. You may recall um, that early gene therapy programs back in the 1990s had, um, had bad immune responses because they were using adenoviruses. Here, adeno-associated viruses, these are um, out there around, they're in the environment, they're largely um, don't cause uh, problems for humans. Um, and so that's why that particular virus has been adopted for most of these um, gene therapies. So, this is the kind of the nuts and bolts, bolts of what might go into one of those uh, viral vectors. Um, you know, you have um, a promoter, so that's the part of the gene that turns the gene on. That's the light switch that turns lights on and off in the room. Um, and um, when companies are designing gene therapies or investigators, um, you can make that light switch on all the time. You can make it so that light switch only turns on in the bedrooms. You can make it so that light switch turns on when you um, say, you know, into your Alexa or Siri that turn on the light. Um, uh, there's just a wide variety of those promoters. And really, um, that's an important step because that's what allows that gene to be expressed effectively into the muscle cells. So if you have um, you can imagine if you're missing a gene or a protein, you want something that allows that gene to be really well expressed in your, um, in your muscles that are missing it. You have the transgene itself, which is the, um, uh, here for most, in most cases, is the gene that's missing. Um, and then you have kind of the, the end polyadenylation sequence. A really important point of gene therapy as it stands today in 2021 is that the maximum 
length is 4.7 kilobases. Um, so for those of you who are old enough to remember burning CDs or DVDs from your computer or, or even on a uh, flash drive, you know, there's only so much that you can fit onto that. And so um, that's going to uh, be an important thing. I'm going to come back to that maximum length when we talk about various different uh, forms of limb girdle and how people are thinking about it. Let me go to the next slide. Um, so then the other piece uh, that you need to think about or need your, the investigators thought about, um, the clinical trialist and physician has thought about, and you should know, is this uh, viral vector. So Dr. Matthews spoke about this as well, that many gene therapies, you know, uh, for limb girl muscular dystrophy, you want a AAV vector that can get into the muscle. And so this is a list of naturally occurring AAV vectors um, and many uh, development programs in limb girl muscular dystrophy have used either AAV9 or AAV8 or even AAV7. And you, know, you can see if you look at what target organs they go to, um, that the reason why you're choosing that as opposed to say AAV2 is because you want a virus that goes to the muscle. That's an important thing. Um, you may want a virus that goes to the heart, like in LGBR9. So um, uh, AV9 might be more preferential than, say, AV7, for example. But one real uh, important um, caveat here is that you'll notice that every single one of those naturally occurring vectors that goes to the muscle also goes to the liver. Um, and liver is not an affected organ in the limb girl muscular dystrophies. And um, the more virus that you accumulate in the liver, as we've learned from spinal muscular atrophy, um, the more toxicity, the more somebody can have side effects or problems from getting the virus. And so the real balance in designing these clinical trials is to make sure that you give enough of the virus to get the gene to the muscle, uh, but not so much that you cause problems in the liver. And um, that's an area of intense research right now. Um, there's a lot of active development in that. And in, in um, while I'm not talking about it today, um, these are naturally occurring viruses. The synthetic viruses that people are designing are designed to fix that problem in a lot of ways. They're designed to get more virus into the muscle at a lower virus level um, um, and a less into the liver. So at the end of the day, that's, a, that's gonna be an important discussion point. When you hear people talk about clinical trials that are coming, you may hear people talk about this viral vector issue. Next slide. We talked a little bit about the promoter. I'm not going to promote her. I'm not going to spend a lot of time about it, but you should just know that you know when you're getting a gene replacement therapy, people are thinking about a promoter that is turned on in the muscle, that it's um, it gets to highly expressed genes, and it's really the main driver of gene expression. So, you know, the efficacy of the of the gene therapy depends on the ability of the virus to deliver the gene to the muscle and how well that promoter turns that gene on. So at the end of the day, those are really kind of two important levers we have um, to making for more effective gene therapy. Next slide. All right, so um, you know, here we talk about the types of carbers. So as it stands right now, um, uh, it tends to be capped at 4.7 kilobases of exogenous DNA. And this is, this is a big deal in limb girdle. Um, I think um, for smaller genes like the sarcoglycans, it's not a problem. You can fit the entire gene in there. Um, for, even for FKRP, you can fit the entire gene in there. For genes like dysferlin, for example, that by itself is too big of a gene to fit alone in one virus. And so one thing you can do, which is shown on the figure here, is to give half the gene in one um, virus and give the other half, the back half of the gene in another virus. And um, if you um, put the right kind of coding sequences on it and you give both viruses at the same time, when they're in the cells, they can, they can um, come into the, uh, they can combine um, to rejoin and, and create um, um, a sufficient length of, uh, of the dysferlin pro or gene, um, for example. So that's that dual vector approach. Um, other approaches like in Duchenne muscular dystrophy is to trim the sequence down into the minimal important length. So it's like a micro dystrophin, uh, which has been tried, like I said, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. 
For some of our limb girl muscular dystrophies, like those affected by um, uh, tightenopathies, for example, um, um, this would require multiple viruses at the same time. So I think those, some of those larger genes, um, this is gonna be an issue we're gonna have to encounter. We have to figure out a way um, to get beyond that. And so if you're thinking about the genes that are first up in terms of gene replacement therapies, those are one of the reasons for why that might be is because they involve a, a gene mutation that isn't a smaller gene. And so it's easier to deliver that. And so I think, you know, when you're, like I said, when you're speaking to the investigators or the companies or the clinician in front of you, um, that's a real consideration depending on what form um, of limb girl muscular dystrophy you have. Next slide. We talked about a little bit, some of the other kind of limitations of gene therapy. Uh, liver tropism, so the fact that these gene therapies go to liver may lower the amount of gene replacement that you're able to receive. It may um, have issues with the overall weight of a person um, and the ability to give it to um, give the right amount of a gene replacement. Um, there is, as we've learned uh, from spinal muscular atrophy, as Dr. Matthews alluded to as well, there can often be a transient immune reaction. I think at this point, I, again, based on the learnings there, um, you know, people have a, a pretty good handle on how to try to, to deal with that. Um, and then I think there's an open question about durability. Um, as it stands, like I said, in 2021, um, the um, um, idea is that you can really only give one of these gene therapies once uh, because you do generate an immune reaction uh, following that uh, viral delivery. Um, and the idea is that that gene continues to exist in the muscle cells and it continues to uh, produce a missing uh, protein, um, but your muscle cells divide, they replicate. Um, and so whether or not that's durable over a lifetime of a person is an open question and, and will require future study as, as we continue to move forward with these um, therapies. I think the other limitation that I didn't speak to um, is that Largely what we've been talking about is that you're missing a gene and that you are able to deliver that gene that you're missing back. Um, and that works pretty well for a lot of the recessive forms of limb girdle. So LGMD2 or LGMDR. It works less well uh, for some of the dominant forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So LGMD1 or LGMDD. Um, and I'm not going to talk about it today, but I think in the future, you know, knockdown approaches using this type of approach may be possible. Next slide. Okay, so let's look at some data. People have made lots of headway with these types of gene therapy. Um, this is data um, looking at um, a particular gene therapy for beta sarcoglycan. Um, and there you can see uh, perhaps the best figure is there on the right, where you can see that. Um, um, the untreated mouse um, our, uh, muscles are on the left side of that panel and they're kind of dark and you don't see any protein expression. And when you deliver that gene therapy, um, you're able to see the return of that sarcoglycan beta expression. And uh, the figure on the right shows that um, it goes into lots of places that you care about. So it goes into the muscles, it goes into the heart, it goes into the breathing muscles. Um, and so that's, you know, that's quite promising data. Next slide. Um, and that um, in those same mice, um, that's great that they can show that they can return expression of the protein, but do they get better? Do they get stronger? Um, and here are two measures, one looking at strength and the other is looking at muscle fatigue and what you can see um, in the far bar or the treated mouse that opposed to either the knockout uh, that, that they're substantially stronger and less fatigued than the knockout and really actually quite close to what a wild type mouse would be. Um, so it's great um, as we have, and I think people have said before, it's great that we're able to effectively show that we can treat a mouse. Um, but I think, you know, whether or not this is gonna be effective in the human um, is an open question and, and something I think most of us are pretty excited to start to understand. Next slide. Uh, this is probably um, one of the, one of, if not the most advanced um, gene replacement program across the limb girl muscular dystrophies. Um, and uh, this data is taken from the Sarepta website. So you can go to the same website I did and look at it yourself. Um, and what they showed in their early phase clinical trial um, in that very initial cohort, they were able to show that CK was reduced. So um, 
it was, um, there's less sign of muscle damage. They were able to show that the beta sarcoglycan was, um, expression was improved, which is what you want to see, um, and that um, functional measures were improved. So all very promising data from that early phase clinical trial as it stands. So next slide. Um, so I think, I think we're really at the precipice. You know, this is kind of like, um, you know, you're just about to turn on the fire hose here with all of these different programs, which is just super excited for, um, I speak for myself as a clinician and investigator. I know it's excited for the patient community as well. Um, Dr. Matthews alluded to or spoke about uh, the FKRP gene therapy programs that are coming uh, in the near term, likely in the next year or so. Um, but beyond that, you can see um, kind of the, the list of different gene, genes that are targeted uh, either in clinical programs. So these are um, people are doing early safety studies at beta sarcoglycan, alpha sarcoglycan, or dysferlin. Um, or if you look at um, these companies' websites, you can see that um, sarcoglycan gamma, uh, ANO5, calpane 3 and FKRP are all uh, in the near term being targeted for um, gene replacement programs. So that's a lot of hope and optimism um, that we can get over the hump uh, for these particular um, uh, subtypes of limb girl muscular dystrophy. And I know um, that um, we will learn a lot uh, through doing these clinical trials um, as a partnership with you um, and that uh, hopefully we become more efficient and, and continue to design better uh, gene therapies as we go. Next slide. A brief word, uh, so that so the nice thing, um, and, and Dr. Matthews alluded to this as well, it's kind of in the same bucket as gene therapy. So um, uh, cell therapies are also in early development across the limb girl muscular dystrophy. So, um, you know, skeletal muscles um, in theory have um, substantial amount of regenerative capacity. So when you exercise and you break down muscles, you're breaking down muscles, you're growing new muscles. Um, so how can we harness that regenerative capacity, that natural regenerative capacity of skeletal muscles? The problem, of course, in lingual muscular dystrophies is that those muscles still have the same gene defect. So um, one idea is that you can take the kind of the satellite cells, or these are the cells from which you grow new muscles, um, and you can take, out, take them out um, and put in, you know, correct the gene defect and put them back in. Um, and that will allow those muscles to regrow. So this has been ongoing work in um, oncology. So there's, um, you know, there's a roadmap here to follow. Um, it's a bit cumbersome as it stands right now. And I'm not going to go into details about issues around kind of your body's immune response to, to foreign cells. Uh, but there is early development in LGMD2A or R1 uh, for, for a similar type of therapy. Next slide. And this just shows that um, there's a model for this uh, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So people across the muscular dystrophy are thinking about um, restoring satellite cell populations, and that would allow you to kind of regrow and regenerate um, a healthy uh, skeletal muscle. So lots more to come. I think there's a lot of hope and optimism. Um, you know, we're, we're reliant on your participation, on your partnership as part of these uh, clinical trials as they proceed. Uh, on the foundational natural history studies of patient registries um, that develop the tools um, to appropriately study and develop these uh, new exciting therapies. And, and of, of course, you know, um, just our fingers crossed that we can see some success here. And that's everything I have. Thanks everybody for those excellent presentations. We're now going to move into the question and answer portion. Um, my first question is actually for Dr. Kang. So if somebody was to participate in a trial, would that make them ineligible to participate in another clinical trial? That's a really good question and an important one for patients to keep in mind. Natural history study trial participation or natural history study uh, participation generally doesn't disqualify you from participating in a clinical trial. However, if you are receiving a potential new treatment in a clinical trial, there are times when that may interfere with participation in a future trial. And the rules vary depending on the, the exact two trials involved. Sometimes you just have to be off the first treatment for a while to be eligible for the second one. Sometimes if you've gotten the first treatment at all, um, you can't participate in certain other trials. 
And it doesn't mean that you can't get the therapy later on if it's FDA approved. There are different rules for that that'll be established. But the, uh, the goal is to get the most clear data possible. And so that's the goal of the investigators, as well as to make sure that they're observing the safest conditions possible. Great. And a, a quick follow-up question to that. If um, somebody was to join a clinical trial and change their mind, are they allowed to leave? I believe that it's generally required that any consent form has a provision for a patient to leave the study. However, there are instances where, for example, with a gene therapy trial, if you've already received the gene therapy, it's typically a one dose administration, as my colleagues have mentioned, then um, as Dr. Johnson has mentioned, then, um, then um, it, you can't uh, generally take that back so you do need to be monitored. However, if you are in a trial where you're receiving uh, a medication or a new therapy that requires, say, a weekly infusion through an IV or taking a pill once a day, that is something that you can stop if you really feel that you're experiencing unwanted side effects or if there are other reasons that, um, uh, that have triggered this change in, in your decision. Uh, there are provisions for that, and even if you withdraw, the investigators will be monitoring you for safety to make sure that everything is okay. Uh, it does cause some problems in terms of data analysis and interpretation of the trial when patients withdraw, especially if there are a lot of them do. And so, so you do want to think carefully before you sign up and be ready to make that commitment. And that's why I mentioned that you should ask questions about how invasive it is, how much travel is involved all of these things that will give you an idea of what the true commitment is. But, but yes, in answer to your question, there are pretty much always provisions for withdrawal and, and that you'll be taken care of if that becomes necessary. Thank you. Um, my next question is for Dr. Johnson. I know that a lot of people are excited about investigational clinical trials because they want to be the first to um, get a potential treatment, but there's a lot of concern about placebo groups. Um, some people really don't want to be put into one. So can you speak a little bit about what placebo groups look like for LGMD trials? Yeah, I mean, I think um, that's a great question and um, I certainly appreciate it. Um, one of the real challenges in, in understanding um, whether or not a treatment works in limb girdle muscular dystrophy is that it's a pretty heterogeneous disease. So um, there's a wide range of ages and disabilities and people progress at different rates. And so um, that means that um, using old data to see whether or not a new treatment works can be um, fraught with error. At, at the end of the day, we don't wanna um, bring a therapy onto the market and give it to a lot of people if we're not sure it works effectively because these are likely to be um, pretty big deal therapies and, and fairly expensive to boot. So um, uh, many cl clinical trials require the use of a placebo arm and that ensures that we're able to really say in a mass group whether or not that drug works. The, the plus side here is that um, while it's not guaranteed, many of those same clinical trial programs do offer at the end of the study, um, the active therapy. Um, um, and so um, as Dr. Kang mentioned, uh, that would be something that you would really wanna understand or hope to understand as best as you could um, before entering into the study. So um, some studies have different ratios of the number of people that get placebo versus the active therapy. Um, and some studies make an, a commitment early on that there's going to be what's called an open label phase where everybody gets the treatment. Um, but no, no two studies are created the same. And so um, that's just an important thing that when you're speaking with the investigator in front of you, that you uh, understand, you know, what, what's the chance you're going to get placebo? And um, at the end of the day, if there's an opportunity that you might get that um, drug at the end of the study um, before it's fully approved. Thank you. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Matthews. Oh, uh, sorry. Did anybody um, else want to comment on that? Okay. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Matthews. Um, I think one, one thing that everybody wants to know is not just, you know, when will there be clinical trials, but when will there be an approved treatment that anybody can access? I know it's a really hard question to answer, um, but can you uh, comment a little bit on, are we talking about 
if there's a clinical trial, might there be a medicine in a year, a decade? Um, what, what does it look like for other diseases and what might it look like for limb girdle? Great question. And if I had a magic ball, I would rub it right now and give you a good answer, but um, there's not a perfect answer. We never know because as has been mentioned before, we don't know whether the trial, the things currently in development are going to show effect or no effect. Um, in general, something like um, about 60%, I think, of um, studies that get to phase three are ultimately approved. If I recall that um, number correctly. Nick's nodding, so I'm gonna, that's about right. So, um, so that gives you some idea of probabilities. Um, if you think, and then in terms of the time frame, you think about what has to happen. So let's say a study starts today and needs to enroll 100 patients, and it's a rare disease. And the study, these are often slowly progressive diseases. And let's say we don't have, we have to go with a clinical outcome measure, and the study has to run for a year and a half to two years. So if you say it might take up to a year to get 100 patients enrolled across the country or internationally, and then all of those 100 patients have to be followed by, for two years to get an answer from the study, and then we have to analyze it. So now we're at three years, and then we have to go to the FDA and get approval if it's a beneficial, you know, if our analysis shows that it's beneficial. So we are not talking, we're going to have an FDA approved drug at the end of the year, most likely. Um, I, I extended this, you know, maybe we'll have a good biomarker and we'll be able to answer the question in six months, not a year. But the short answer is that in general, we're talking about years, not months, once a study opens. And I'd be delighted to hear other people's thoughts about that. I think that the other number I like to use, Dr. Matthews, is it takes about, for a rare disease, about three to five years once you start um, human clinical trials to get to approval, so. Um, assuming the drug works. Assuming the drug, drug works. works, yes. Could I just make one other comment about clinical trials in general? I'm gonna add one thing to the things that Dr. Kang mentioned that you should ask about, um, and that is what kind of financial support is there? We've talked a lot about the commitment that families make in terms of um, participating. And most trials will provide for support for your travel and your hotel and your food, um, but not your time off work and not your childcare. But that's another question that I would say that you should clarify when you're thinking about the commitment of being in a trial. Thank you, Jen. Great point, thank you. Um, a lot of the people watching today have subtypes that were not um, specifically mentioned during the talks today. I was wondering if um, Dr. Johnson could maybe speak about what's going on with these rare subtypes or if maybe um, they would be eligible for treatment with something that's currently being developed for uh, another subtype. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, this is a this is a challenge that I know we think about within the Grassville GP Consortium. I know that the um, state, other stakeholders in the community are considering this as well. Uh, one of the real problems with gene replacement therapy is that if you've seen it for one subtype, it's only for one subtype. And there's a lot of subtypes for limb girdle and muscular dystrophy. Um, I think in the future, I'm hopeful that as this path gets paved, um, for some of the more common subtypes that it will become easier um, to, to bring it to bear uh, for some of the more rare, rare subtypes. Um, but each subtype um, that I didn't talk about has some different challenges. So for the dominant forms of limb girdle and muscular dystrophy, by and large, our goal is going to end up being to knock down that gene expression, uh, which is different than replacing and, and something that, um, you know, there's more work that needs to go on um, in academic labs or um, uh, other labs that are to, to think about such a thing. And then for some of the other subtypes, one of the real challenges for gene replacement therapy is to 
figure out how to fit that size of a gene into that particular virus vector. And I think that's work that again needs to happen at the same time. So, um, and I think there's a, a lot of hope. I didn't put in my talk, uh, but I know somebody out there would ask a question about it. So I'll say it anyways, uh, about CRISPR therapy, uh, where you're able to more precisely um, uh, deal with a specific mutation. And there, you know, I think there's still several years worth of work that needs to happen to really understand the safety of that type of approach. Um, so I think, you know, that we should all take heart in the progress that's been made in the subtypes that we talked about today, uh, because that does, those lessons will 100% apply to the subtypes that weren't talked about. Um, but for those other ones, I think we, we continue need to work at, to make those therapies more effective and easier to deliver. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Does anybody else uh, want to comment? Um, yes, Dr. Matthew. I say one other thing that um, I think that some of the therapies are nonspecific. So there, I mentioned myostatin therapy, which inhibitor therapy, which didn't help, which didn't wasn't shown to be effective. However, there are other nonspecific therapies, and some of those may cross limb girdle types. And it is likely that at the end of the day, we will be combining multiple therapies rather than having one pill to, you know, that totally fixes things. So even within a subtype, we may be combining things. I can add one other comment as well. I think as more research is being done on these limb girdle muscular dystrophy subtypes, we are getting a better idea of what the disease mechanisms are. And a lot of them are connected for different limb girdle subtypes. So if you recall Dr. Matthew's really nice slide about FKRP, you could see that there are multiple enzymes related to limb girdle muscular dystrophy that contribute to that pathway. So I think one thing that would be very helpful in the future would be to find treatments that could potentially apply to multiple subtypes. Thank you, Dr. Matthews and Dr. Kang. Uh, Dr. Mosafar, I didn't get you in there. <laughs> would you like a question? No, I, th I think we've covered pretty much all of the topics, but I, I think I wanna reemphasize what Dr. Kang said that um, being in a natural history study doesn't ne necessarily exclude you from participating in a clinical trial. Um, now, gene therapy is a different issue because gene therapy may uh, uh, create permanent um, depot of, of a drug or a permanent uh, change to the um, um, cell ma machinery. So that is a different issue, but um, you can always... Um, participate in a drug trial and, and going from one drug trial to another drug trial requires some period of washout, uh, which varies from 30 to 60 days, but you can always participate in that as well. I hope we have that good of a problem where we have multiple drugs and a disease. Um, that would be a good thing to have. Great. Well, that's all my questions. Thank you everybody for the excellent talks and the um, illuminating discussion. Thank you. When somebody has a devastating disease, it affects not only the family structure, but it really affects the community at large. Disease doesn't just affect the patient, but it affects a much wider spectrum of people. Aspio is an AV gene therapy company. We provide treatments for devastating disease. Often these diseases have no viable treatment option. We have worked on Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, Pompeii, hemophilia, heart failure, and Parkinson's disease. ASPBio was started when I gave a course at University of North Carolina. The course was teaching professors how to start spin-out companies, and in the audience was Dr. Richard Jude Samolsky. And he had a lot of intellectual property uh, at the university. So he came up to me and he said, I need help but I can't pay you, and there's a lot of skepticism about this technology, but if and when we make it work, we'll change the world. Gene therapy is a very simple concept. Now the question is, how do you get the gene into the body? We use an adeno-associated virus, or AAV, as a carrier to get into the body. So what we do is we take out the wild type DNA of the AAV, and so now it's just a protein shell, 
and in that we can put our therapeutic payload. And for most diseases, that means a one-time treatment option for patients. Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is a neuromuscular disease that affects young boys. These little boys lose the ability to walk, usually in their early teens. Often they die by the time they're in their 30s. Today, our drug is being advanced by Pfizer into pivotal clinical trials, and we've seen the results of little boys who were treated who can barely walk four steps and are now in swimming lessons and Little League Baseball. It took us a long time before we got our first round of financing. Today, the company is over 350 professionals operating in five different countries. We have three different drugs in the clinic and we expect that we'll have a very strong pipeline with many more therapeutics advancing into the clinic in the very near term. I carried a note for a long time from a little boy who I met who had Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And so he wrote me a note saying, I doubt you're going to be able to have a therapeutic in time for me, but I'm going to look down from heaven and I'm going to be looking out for you and you'll have a therapeutic someday for other boys. That note was really like the thing that kept me motivated. You know, we thought and we were right that we had the potential to treat these diseases. We just needed the opportunity to prove that we could do it. What I like most about being an entrepreneur is every day there's a world full of possibilities. You know, pick a disease, we'll work on it, and we'll make change. And that's incredible. That's really incredible.
Having limb girdle muscular dystrophy causes a huge impact on a person's life. It affects education, choice of career, accommodation in the work environment and at home, family and relationships, and many other areas. In this patient focus session, Planning for the Future, moderated by Melissa Grove, who lives with LGMD and is a professional counselor, several people living with LGMD will share their experiences and give advice on these topics. It's important to benefit from others' knowledge rather than thinking we need to figure it all out by ourselves. Later, Carol Abraham will host a roundtable of different patients living with LGMD to share about solutions to caregiving that they require as a result of their disease. Thank you, Brad, for that introduction. Today we are talking about planning and preparing for your future with limb girdle muscular dystrophy. I don't know about you, but when I found out I was diagnosed with limb girdle muscular dystrophy, I felt very anxious. I felt very stressed. I wondered, what is my future going to look like? Am I going to ever meet anyone? What about a career? How will I support myself? These are all the sort of questions that fly through your head when you find out you or your child is living with a disease. And it can be very, very anxiety provoking. Now I wish I had an easy answer of what's going to happen and what the course of your disease would be and all of these questions. And it would be wonderful if we could just push a button and Google it, but I think we all know it doesn't work that way. But one thing we can do is listen and learn from our peers, other people who've been in the exact same situation we've been and hear how other people have coped with it and some of their strategies. And based on that, we can put together a plan to live a happy, successful life. It may not look like what you originally thought it was going to look like, but it can be wonderful. I was diagnosed when I was 18. I was away at college on a theater scholarship, and I was very excited that I had received this elite special honor to go away to college and be paid to go learn about theater, my lifelong dream. Then when I came out back from Christmas, my doctor told me that I had muscular dystrophy and he really didn't know much about it and he really didn't know what the course would be and I was very alone and I didn't even really feel comfortable sharing it with my family because I knew they'd be really upset and I didn't have the energy to caretake for them while I myself was dealing with it. I thought, well, what am I going to do for my future now? So I started thinking about, well, what do I like about acting? What do I think is interesting? I thought, well, it's about the study of characters. It's about looking at people's motivations. That kind of sounds a lot like being a psychotherapist. And I thought, yeah, I could be a therapist, and that's a job I could do from a wheelchair. So I completely shifted gears and changed my major and moved to Austin, Texas, and got my master's degree as a therapist. And then as I took jobs, I found myself, because I'm bossy, becoming the boss everywhere I went. And so that ended up taking me in a whole other direction into business management. And now I manage a $2 million nonprofit counseling center with a homeless housing program Oh, it's huge. There's a lot to it. It's really complicated, but I love it. So it's really funny how life can take us on a completely different direction than what we ever planned. But that being said, we still have to face those questions, and it can be very anxiety-provoking. But the enemy of anxiety is action. Action kills anxiety. If you have energy to worry, you have energy to take an action. And you're taking an action today by being on this talk. So I would like to start off by introducing our first speaker, Alexandra. And she's going to be telling you a little bit about her experience and how she coped with it. Great to see you. I'm Alexandra Leyenhorst and I have four kids. My son has LGMD 2D and my daughter has collagen 6 disorder, which is now considered LGMD R22. 
Some of you may know me as chair of Stichting Spierkracht, some of you as coordinator of the CAB, but today I'm talking about a subject that I'm always very passionate about, it's education. In this short presentation, I will share you with my experience on five different topics, and we will also have a checklist available at the end, so you can work with school at home. Advocating for your child. LGMD does not define your child. Teachers are trained to educate, but they also have a lot to learn from you. They are not trained for kids with severe diseases. And besides your head of the hats you're wearing as parent, driver, caregiver, private PT, nurse, you can also add the head advocate. When my son had his first day at school, his teacher welcomed us and said, so I don't have to invest much to him. And I looked at her and I think I have to thank her that she made it so obvious clear that I had to advocate for my son from the first day on. This also made me ambassador for the Dutch Foundation Carefree to School, as all kids and families with severe chronic illness face the same issues. So after the first week, she told me, oh, your son is so sweet. When I'm going to read the books in circle time, he completely leans into me. And I told her that it was not sweet, but that it was a sign of exhaustion. And at the end of the morning, he couldn't sit straight anymore. So the label sweet when he was six became demotivated in high school. Nobody likes a teenager who just leans over his desk. But the right label, however, was exhausted. It was very soon that we found out as parents that we were often seen as overprotective. When we told that to our pediatrician, he said that he was very willing to have a talk with the teachers. And when we talk about the medical situation, what we could expect that year, what the teacher needed to know and how we could make that year successful. We call it the golden triangle meeting, student, teacher, parents. Educate the teachers. There are many myths about LGMD. Many of our families got a wrong diagnosis in the beginning. And it's good to know that even if you have the right diagnosis, we don't have a textbook for LGMD. Things are very different for every child. And the checklist, the foundation carefree to school use is a tool to make custom plans for each student for every year. And we all know that we never have a normal year. So we need to talk on a regular basis. And the language of a teacher is different than the language of a caregiver. For instance, when you talk about resting, we had a teacher that scheduled an exam after physical education lessons because she thought that that was a moment of sitting in a chair and resting, but it was for my son almost the Olympic games. And we also had a teacher who thought that when the school begins the day, that it was the start of the day but she forgot that getting out of bed, having breakfast, getting dressed, making it to school was already a day before. Fitting in and being normal. Students want to be normal. A big myth is that they fake fatigue and have benefits and exceptions. Mondays and days after parties are days that they are exhausted because everything takes more energy. And I always explain to teachers that it is important to have enough energy for a social life. Limitations are not limiting. Is it really productive going a whole day to school because it is the way school works, even when your kid is exhausted and cannot sit anymore? We learned that energy was a good measurement to follow. After we found out that my kids go above and beyond their energy and literally became sick, we adapt the hours in school. It can be quite a balancing act between physical therapy, school, social activities and your child's energy. You do not always need to put school first but this can be hard to, to arrange in daily life and it doesn't make you popular as parent. It can be difficult to understand for teachers, so you need to explain it. I asked my daughter what I should bring up this, in this talk and she, to she said, tell them to think in possibilities and normal as long as possible. Children with chronic illnesses have the same dreams and rights as other children. Education is important and I think we have wonderful examples in our community of people that became doctor, air traffic controller, lawyer, researcher, teachers, occupational therapists. And it is a big myth that you don't need to invest in education because people might think you won't have a long-term career. Education gives you a goal and opportunities to build a normal future. You don't have to work full-time or forever but it is important to do things you like. And the earlier you take your energy battery serious, the better. Working together. So these examples were some practical experience. What I want to do with you getting to our polder model. 
The Netherlands is well known for the dikes and polders because most of the Netherlands are below sea level. Without dikes, we would be underwater. This means that we have a history of working together between different groups and different villages. Everybody need to pitch in basically make sure we would not drown. This polder model can also be applied to creating a good education for LGMD children. Have regular talks with school and always keep the students central. Don't be afraid to add experts in a meeting. And that's not because you cannot do it, but it is because it helps you. Also, do not forget to arrange help for yourself. Join an advocacy group or, for example, a foundation like we set up Carefree to School. This conference is global, and I know that schooling systems worldwide are very different. In the US, all schools have ramps. In the Netherlands, only the new ones. So first decision is, am I going to take a school nearby, or do I choose a school that is accessible? Adaptations can be very small, but make a big difference in the quality of life. For instance, two lockers on a suitable level, two sets of books so you don't have to carry. The adaptations in the classroom, adaptations in the schedule, looking at the students' individual needs, even small and detailed, and exploring the options to make it work. This is really crucial. A student with LGMD wants to be taken seriously. They have a muscle disease. It does not affect their intelligence. Find something to compensate the physical education and find something they can excel. For instance, music, language, IT. If you have a school year with a long period of sickness, try to save one course that the student can succeed instead of failing all courses and losing the year. Celebrate life successes. The need of successful experience, learning should be fun. It is the golden age of your child. Talk about the future and the dot on the horizon. Don't forget that the landscape of LGMD is changing. While researchers are working on gene therapy, make sure that you work on the things you invest in education. My son used to go half days to school, but he graduated this year with merit. Instead of going to university, he decided to take a year in between. As not all things in life you learn in school. Thank you for this opportunity to give this presentation to you and share my experience in education. It is great to give back to the LGMD community, and I hope that this will help you in your journey as an advocate for your child's future. Thank you, Alexandra, for sharing your experience with us. And now we'd like to bring in Jasmine, who's going to be talking about her experience with college. Hi, Jasmine. Thank you, Melissa. Um, as a student with limb girdle muscular dystrophy, subtype 2A, um, I received a ton of help entering University of Georgia, which is located in Athens, Georgia. Um, coming in, I was really not sure how I was going to actually navigate through school because I've always done online schooling. And now that I'm stepping more into my major, I actually had to come on campus. So I end up finding um, connections through social media of other students who had disabilities that used the Disability Resource Center at UGA. Um, and I reached out to them and explained to them my diagnosis, um, accommodations that I'm looking into having. And we was able to set up a meeting uh, to discuss those things. And it turned out to be awesome um, to the point where once I come to school, like once I drive myself there, um, someone actually picks me up and they have my schedule and they take me around to all of my classes. And they will actually pick me up once the end of my class um, is over and Pretty much that is something that they will actually do for me as long as I'm a student at University of Georgia. Um, not only just transportation, sometimes my arms get weak and they have this accessible pen that I can put inside of my computer, which will pick up the notes for me because as you know, someone with limb girdle um, as my type, um, my arms tends to just get weak. Um, so that was another plus um, besides like having a note taker um, but just having the Disability Resource Center 
it kind of just helped me out because I really had no idea how I was going to even just move around on campus as far as in carrying books, which is something else that I don't necessarily have to worry about. Um, they are providing everything digital for me, so I don't have to worry about ever carrying a book. Um, but I think it's just important when attending the college is to find out as much as you can to accommodate yourself. Um, if you don't speak up or as, it would probably never, you know, happen for you. Um, there was an instance as far as in my main concern was using the restroom with having limb girdle. Um, I cannot stand myself. So that was another big worry of mine as far as in what's going to happen when I have to go to the restroom. Um, they have like the rail bars, which is accessible, but it's not like our type of accessibility that we need. So I was able to speak to the dean and see if there's any way that the school can pay for um, a seat riser, which pretty much just goes up and stand me up. Um, thank God that I did open my mouth and explain my situation because they actually funded that uh, for every building um, that I'll be attending on campus to have that seat so I can use the restroom safely. Besides the accommodations that I have received on campus, the next thing that is super important to me is finding a major that I can not only um, inspire others, but actually give back to myself. Um, at one point, I started off majoring in education, and I just started thinking about like the whole schedule as far as in waking up in the morning knowing that sometimes my muscles give me a fight and just sitting at a desk grading papers, which is nothing wrong with that, but I just wanted to kind of like find me um, with muscular dystrophy. So I end up doing some research and speaking to people on campus and I end up majoring in public relations. Um, public relations, mass communication and journalism. And I just had to think back since my diagnosis. Um, I woke up every day hearing my own family and friends telling me um, I should stay home um, because school or just the, the workload would be too much. Um, but I just continued to kind of live out my purpose. I didn't actually let my dreams fade away based off of their comments. So I began to step out of my comfort zone with sharing just like my daily life looks um, advice or tips or life hacks um, and accommodations. So, however, what I received in return was not just awareness, but relatability. Um, there was an instance where I received a message from the mother of a seven-year-old girl that shares the same disease as me, stating that she had feared for her daughter's life. But she actually regained hope after watching my videos. And at that moment, it really made me realize that this is bigger than me. So creating more content that is made by or for disabled people is very important because there's like a lack of representation um, in media, which made me want it to step into the public relations route. And thank you so much for your time. And I will now give it back to Melissa. Thank you, Jasmine. Really enjoyed hearing about your experience at college. And now we're going to bring up Kay. She's going to talk about starting her own business. Hi, Kay. Thanks, Melissa. Um, my name is Kay Tran, and I am living in Toronto, Ontario. I am a freelance art director, brand designer, and advocate for disability and accessibility rights. Um, my symptoms started around the age of 13, 14, so that would be in grade eight. And this, the symptoms were as subtle as uh, not being able to tippy toe, um, jump as high, run as fast, um, but I was still quite mobile. So I was still able to run and climb stairs. It wasn't until high school that I realized my symptoms were, were serious. Uh, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I took a wide variety of courses to keep my options open. And I later thought maybe I would become an artist or a kindergarten teacher or a nurse, 
Um, but with my symptoms really becoming serious, I realized those weren't viable anymore. So I had to ask myself stuff like, what did I really want to do? Uh, what did I enjoy doing? What didn't feel like work? And most importantly, what jobs can I do that didn't require a lot of physical action or um, wasn't physically demanding? And for me, it was media arts. Um, so it would be like graphic design and audio, everything involving technology. And that, uh, that meant I could sit at a desk. So I applied for three programs. I got into two of them and I pursued advertising design at OCAD University. And looking back in hindsight, it was actually a blessing in disguise that I got symptoms early. Um, this allowed me to plan ahead and prepare myself to set myself up for success. So fast forward to university, I did five years of undergrad and got my Bachelor of Design. Um, that was a really hard journey. There were many times I thought I wasn't gonna make it, um, like physically make it and let alone graduate. Um, there was a lot of falls, a lot of weakness. Um, I wasn't using a cane at that point yet. so. Uh, it was very invisible. People didn't fully understand it and I didn't really talk about it. So I just went about as any young adult would and um, then came to the end of the year at my grad show. I got scouted by one of Canada's top three digital ad agencies and they wanted me to fly out to Vancouver to intern for them. I was so sad I had to say no because it wasn't accessible. So I went about with my life and uh, tried to forge my own career path. Unfortunately, the university didn't teach you how to uh, freelance or run your own business. And I was at a huge disadvantage because all my peers all had internships during undergrad and I didn't. So I had nothing on my resume, I had no experience and I had a disability. So it was a lot working against me. And um, I just, it was a lot of trial and error, um, a lot of guesswork, a lot of rejection, <laughs> defeat, a lot of lows um, to try to build my clientele and career path as a freelancer. I was having no luck, like I did everything. I applied at recruiting agencies. I did a, I applied a lot of single job postings. I did a lot of passion projects. I did a lot of free projects um, and still nothing because I was either seen as a liability or I was seen as, um, uh, sorry, it wasn't accessible. So like, it wasn't that I wasn't qualified for it. It just, it just, I wasn't, I couldn't get in and a lot of companies didn't understand me. So uh, unfortunately, I was just in the dark for like three, four years after I graduated. And something that never left my mind was turning down that ad agency that had scouted me. And so um, out of desperation, I actually flew out to Vancouver and spoke to the founders of the ad agency. And I I just wanted some kind of guidance, but we ended up hitting it off and they offered me an internship in Toronto. So I go to Toronto, come back home and their office isn't accessible. So I, I had to do this job through entering the back door every single day for my whole internship. And that was like a whole struggle in itself before doing the work. But I'm very proud I did it, I completed it. So that was a four and a half month internship and it taught me a lot. It really confirmed that um, the industry nine to five life isn't for me. Um, and it really showed me that my worth doesn't come from my job title and that I'm way better and more talented than I give myself credit for. So naturally, if you are working alone and if you are um, you know, a, a business owner, you're going to have imposter syndrome, which I even still have till this day. Uh, so I left that job and ended up getting a lot of referrals maybe just one, but it, it snowballs. It really is a snowball effect. And I still have that till today. So uh, the work I find now is still through application, like, but it's also word of mouth. So that is your best friend. And so networking and being authentic really helps. So where I'm at today is a very comfortable spot, but I'm not exactly where I want to be. Um, I want to eventually become a consultant or an educator 
or a product designer, and I want to marry my skill set of design thinking with um, my passion for accessibility awareness and advocacy. So I feel very fortunate that the stars have aligned with my skill set and my lived experiences. So I feel like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be and I'm so grateful for technology being able to do that. Uh, if anyone were to get into it today, it would be a lot easier than what I had to go through to pave my path. Um, it was, it, especially with remote working and learning today, uh, anyone can do it. But two years ago, three, four, five years ago, it was not a thing and I had to fight tooth and nail to try to work from home. So uh, yeah, technology is our best friend <laughs> and that's where I'm at, so thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Kay. That was very interesting. We really enjoyed that. And now I'd like to bring up my friend Josh. He's going to talk about workplace accommodations. Hi, Josh. Thank you, Melissa. Hi, everyone. I'm Josh Thayer. Um, I live in Massachusetts near Boston, and I've been working as a lawyer for 28 years now. I started at a large firm in 1993. And uh, now I work for the Jane Foundation as their general counsel. I've been asked to speak about my decision to pursue a legal career and how I've maneuvered obstacles that have arisen as my LGMD has progressed. The first question really is, do you want to be a lawyer? Uh, I suppose for me, it was in my blood. My father was a lawyer, his father was a lawyer, and his father was a lawyer too. I didn't know exactly what my dad did as a child, but I did sense that he found it to be meaningful. And I knew it could be kind of fun because when I was 10 years old, my brother asked if he could use my walk-in closet as his art studio. I made him sign a lease, which I drafted. So it was quite landlord favorable. For those of you who are interested in being a lawyer, the first point I want to make is that having an LGMD does not change the um, fundamentals of succeeding in law school and later as a lawyer. You have to be willing to study hard and work long hours. Uh, you, have to be, you have to actually enjoy conducting research and reading and writing long, complex documents. Your job is to help people resolve problems and disputes, so it's a lot of responsibility. But it is doable. Um, we can do this as well as anyone else. Uh, having LGMD need not diminish our goals, our ambitions. In fact, in our community, uh, we have PhD researchers, we have physicians, engineers, physicists. We even have a tax accountant from Moscow who is gonna to present to us in this conference. My overarching advice is twofold. First, pursue your life goals without worrying about your physical disability. Second, at the same time, Prepare for adjustments that will help accommodate your life with a progressive disease. So how did I do this? First, I only applied to law schools that had a good reputation, uh, had an accessible campus and facilities, uh, and also were located in cities with strong legal markets. In the end, I chose Boston College Law School, which was a great fit for me. Um, as an added bonus, most of my family and friends live in Boston, so I knew at the time I'd be relying on them more in the future. While at Boston College, I was like any other motivated law student. I worked hard. I participated in the classroom discussions. I joined a study group. In other words, I didn't let my worries about the future distract me from my goals. But at the same time, I wasn't shy about asking for accommodations. The very first week, 
I asked for a key to the freight elevator in the library because it was the only building on campus without a general purpose elevator. I also insisted on a parking pass to the staff parking lot, which was behind the main buildings, because the student lot was down a long hill and only accessible by stairs. When it came to choosing a law firm, I took much the same approach that I did for law schools. One of my offers was from a firm in New York City with a number of international offices, including one in Moscow. Now is probably a good time to mention that I'd majored in Russian and Soviet studies as an undergrad and worked for three years between college and law school in jobs that entailed speaking Russian and traveling to the Soviet Union. So the lore to live and work as a lawyer in Moscow was enormous. And yet by then I knew that the challenges of living in New York City and Moscow and traveling back and forth would likely overwhelm me. So instead, I focused on two other firms, uh, both of which were in Boston. While they were both well-established, one prided itself in being sensitive to the personal needs of its employees and their family lives, while the other was notorious for its reputation of being a sweatshop. That was an easy choice for me. I picked the more friendly firm. I found that Life can bring us to the right places for unexpected reasons. Um, I had accepted an offer from the firm uh, as a member of the litigation department, but only weeks before I started, the firm called me and told me that they needed me to work in their business law department. Apparently people weren't suing each other enough at that point, so, uh, I was somewhat devastated initially. I thought I always would be a litigator, uh, which is another term for trial lawyer or barrister, uh, but I didn't really know. And in fact, that change was quite fortuitous for me. Uh, my firm was specializing in representing the then emerging biotechnology industry in Boston and over time, my practice focused on representing such clients in their licensing transactions for drug discovery and development. Some of the diseases that they were trying to target were rare and serious conditions. For example, one of our clients uh, was Genzyme, now part of Sanofi. I worked on a number of their deals, including their licensing transaction for myozyme, which is their therapy for Pompe's disease. Also, the firm was friendly. They really looked out for me. Uh, for example, they paid for a reserved parking space in the building's parking garage for me. They uh, always made sure my office was accessible and relatively near the elevators and restrooms. They even installed power door openers for me without any hesitation. So overall, I consider the legal, a legal career um, to be well-suited to persons with physical disabilities. While the workload can be substantial, so long as you get your work done, the hours can actually be quite flexible. Also, the benefits are still quite good uh, when it comes to healthcare coverage, uh, insurance options, um, uh, retirement plans. And because these programs are, are group policies, you are generally eligible without having to take a medical exam. In my case, I was able to get long-term disability insurance early in my career, which ended up being life-changing. So to wrap up my story so far, um, by the time I was in my late 40s, I found a full-time practice at a large law firm to be too physically demanding. And so I applied for long-term uh, disability coverage, 
and I transitioned to a part-time work schedule at my firm. Uh, after doing that for six years, I really made the first major transition in my career, which was I, I, I left my firm and I went over to the Jane Foundation. At the Jane Foundation, I'm working for my heroes. I am working for people, who, people whose sole mission is literally to cure my specific rare disease. I, I still marvel at this opportunity. Uh, so for anyone who's interested in pursuing a legal career, please don't hesitate to reach out for me. It's, uh, it's definitely thing, something you can manage. Thank you, Josh. I really appreciate you discussing workplace accommodations. That is so important. We have to stand up and get our uh, needs met at work so we can keep living our best life. Well, I hope you've enjoyed listening to these four people discuss their lives and all the ways they had planned for the future. Hopefully there's something you can take away from everything they've told you today. But what I wanna to say to you as a therapist is I hope you dream big. I hope while our disease can be limiting in many ways physically, mentally, we can do anything we wanna do. And so I hope that you dream big and make plans so you can accomplish what you wanna accomplish. Now, it may not look exactly what you originally thought it would look like, but it can be wonderful. And you can achieve in ways that maybe you never really even occurred to you when you were thinking about this before. Even if all you can do physically is reach out to someone and connect to them and make their day special, that is something very important in this world. So just as a quick primer, start by thinking big. Really think about what would bring me happiness, what would bring me joy, what would bring me satisfaction. Once you've done that, think, well, what steps would I need to take to accomplish that? Break it into little tiny pieces and just start tackling it. You may not know exactly what you want to do or where you want to go, and you can get very paralyzed with perfection. But instead, what I want you to do is like you're doggy paddling out in the middle of a lake and you're looking all around you, just pick a place on the shoreline that looks good and swim toward it. As you get closer, you may find, well, wait, that actually looks better. But always be moving forward. Always be moving forward. Now, this is a metaphor. I'm not recommending any of you go out in the middle of a lake and doggy paddle. I know if I did that, it would go very badly. But you get the metaphor. Set a goal and just start moving toward it. Because we always need to be growing, no matter where we're at. And I know at times things can be very difficult. So what I want you to do is to make sure you know you're not alone. There are many people out there to support you at all times. I encourage you to join the Facebook groups for limb girdle muscular dystrophy. I'm a real big fan of that. And also the Breathe with MD group is a very important group to me. In fact, I leaned on them a lot in my recent bout with COVID. And just having people around you to support you and get resources from can be a really good way to plan and prepare for your future. Try to lean on other people who've been in the same boat as you and let them support you. So make your plan, dream big, and move forward. I want to thank you for taking the time, not just for today's presentation, but participating in this conference. By you participating in this conference, you're letting the people out there know that there is a large group of people living with limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And that is a thing that makes people very interested in our patient group. Who knows what our future holds? There's never been such an exciting time for limb girdle muscular dystrophy. When I first was diagnosed, there was nothing happening. And now there are so many studies and exciting things I'm having trouble keeping up, but I want to thank the Speak Foundation for organizing this, and I want to thank all the sponsors who've underwritten it. The work you're doing is very important, and it means a lot to all of us. I hope you have an amazing day, 
and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. In the world, there are thousands of children and adults suffering from beta sarcoglycanopathy and other rare forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. That's why we at GFB Onlus have been by their side since 2010. GFB is in fact the only association in the world that specifically deals with this little known disease to give all patients and their families the opportunity to face it with serenity. We collaborate with institutions and research organizations around the world to develop increasingly targeted treatments for this rare form of dystrophy. In recent years, science has made important progress thanks to the use of gene therapies that are helping us in the treatment of LGMD. Our goal is to extend these therapies to as many patients as possible. In 2021, we launched the Quality Project in order to scientifically study the international network of LGMD patients and test the effectiveness of the new treatments. Through specific international questionnaires, we are able to collect scientific information on the evolution of the disease, the quality of life, and the psychological well-being of patients. Not even language barriers have stopped our mission. For the Quality Project, we are using the technology at our disposal and so we are connecting with the patients in order to help them to fill in the form. And we are using Zoom and at the same time we open a page in Google uh, Translate. So we write the question uh, we want to ask and we do copy and paste so the patient can listen to the question in his or her language. Quality is an important tool for LGMD research and helps to overcome the current lack of patient's data. We ask to the Muscular Dystrophy Association Clinical Center and LGMD 2D to, uh, to see patients of all the world to join the project. Uh, GFB will guarantee that in the future all institutions, researchers and industry will be able to use these data to improve the quality of light of our loved ones. To join the Quality Project, just write an email request to info at betasarcoliconopatia.it. Limb girdle muscular dystrophy affects everyone in the same way. There are no differences among the different countries, cultures or languages. Together, we are stronger.
Welcome everyone to the patient focus session, caregivers, who, what, and how. As muscle weakness progresses, many individuals find that they need, may need assistance with routine activities throughout their day, such as bathing and dressing, as well as other household activities, such as cooking and cleaning. Whether referred to as a caregiver, personal care worker, attendant, home health aide, or any other title, these people play a vital role in the lives of individuals with LGMD at home, at work, or even when traveling. In this session, we have a patient panel that will share their personal experience that they've had with caregivers. I would like to introduce Mark Barnett. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark and I'm 60. And I've been using a caregiver service for about four years now, and it's really changed my life. It all began when I started having trouble getting out of bed. That really started to worry me because I'm home alone all day from seven till five. And the day finally came. I couldn't get out of bed one morning and I thought something has to change. For a short while, I used a family friend that kind of became not so dependable, and I decided I better talk to some of my LGMD friends, and I got a few recommendations for a great agency. I called them out. They evaluated my house, my situation, and a few days later, they started, and it's turned my whole life around. I know someone's going to show up every morning to help me get out of bed and get me dressed and get my breakfast and make sure I'm set for the day before they leave. And I've never looked back. I've got no regrets. It's been a great experience. Also on our panel, we have Annie Bresno. Hi, I'm Anne. Um, my experience with caregivers started in the late 90s. Uh, my husband had emergency surgery and was from that point was unable to lift me or to do anything for a while as he recovered. So I had a bit of a panic because he I needed assistance getting out of bed and getting up to, and ready for work at the time I was working. So um, my mom and I frantically went through the phone book back when there were phone books and we found an agency to come out and start that. So that was the start of it. And ever since then, I've still used caregivers, even though my husband can help um, to give him a bit of a break. So. Andy, what type of assistance do they provide? They get me out of bed. Well, back then it started with getting me out of bed and getting me dressed and off to work. Um, but now it's similar except I'm not working, but they, they get me up and out of bed. And then I've added things over the years and my um, abilities have changed. So they do more work for me, uh, more personal care. And as there's time, we add things like um, some of them assist with my dogs or uh, help with cooking or cleaning or laundry, you know, those types of things. Joining us from the UK, we have Andrew Robertson. Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm 40 years old uh, and I'm from Canterbury in the UK. Um, started using caregivers in 2013, uh, exactly one week before the birth of my son. And um, uh, as many of you will probably have kind of fallen into that kind of um, situation where your partner is your caregiver, that they're, uh, they're helping you throughout the day. And as you're condition progresses like mine did um it it then gets to the point where um you need a bit more help but you don't know and it's very difficult because um my wife didn't want to say we need some more help around the house and i was very shy about asking because what would that mean um other people coming into the house changes the whole dynamic of things but a heavily pregnant woman helping me into bed 
Um, she still helped me into bed the night before she gave birth. Um, and then that morning, her waters broke, and um, she said, uh, right, well, I'll just get you up, and then we'll go to the hospital. I said, no, 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 <laughs> we need to call the caregiver. <laughs> you know, you're in labor. This isn't something that you should be doing anymore. Um, so our hand was, was kind of forced, I suppose, uh, and we've used caregivers... Um, uh, what would be now nine years uh, and we've had ups and downs good times bad times uh, we've used volunteer carers we've had family members we've had agency uh, and we've had long-term carers uh, so quite a few experiences to share but I think um, the main thing and it's a very similar theme uh, to Mark and Anne uh, it's that someone turning up in the morning to help you get up uh, and, and I found that that gave my wife a little bit of a break because if you're the partner of someone with LGMD and you are having to get up first every single day and then go for your routine of getting ready and then get your partner up uh, over 5, 10, 15, 20 years, it, it, it does wear anyone down. Uh, and um, so having someone there to help get me up, a little bit of independence, um, help with uh, some personal care, help me get dressed. And then over the years, it's kind of then given me a bit more confidence to go out places, do more things. Um, which I'm sure we'll come to, but yeah. And we also have Bliss Welch joining us. Hello. So I started needing a caregiver about 10 years ago when I had my daughter. And really it was just to assist in caring for her. So we hired a nanny that was a friend of a friend of the family. Um, as my daughter got older and I needed less physical help with her, um, she continued to stay on and would do various tasks around the house as far as cooking and cleaning and laundry. And so in the last couple of years, um, my needs have changed. I can still do just about everything, but I'm worried about the safety of some of my transfers and so I brought someone new on at the beginning, beginning of this year, who's also a family friend. Um, and she is able to help again with the cooking and cleaning and meal prep. And then some of the things as far as helping me get ready in the morning. And it's just a time management aspect. I'm able to get so much more accomplished when I have help um, getting ready for the day. I think many of our stories are very similar. Um, I know for me, I need, my husband has been my primary caregiver, but once I was no longer working and I was home full time, um, the situation is similar to Mark is, what do I do? I'm home all day. I need to go to the bathroom. I need someone to assist me with going to the bathroom. And that was really when I started bringing a caregiver into my life and it really was something I was hesitant to do at first but once I brought a caregiver in um, I realized that I could take some of the pressure off of my husband and it also gave me some peace of mind that I didn't have to worry about could I wait until my husband gets home from work to go to the bathroom and what am I going to do and what if this happened and what if this happened so um, I can relate to a lot of what you've said. One of the things that we often hear when discussing caregivers is that we use them for some of our most personal of, acti of activities, such as bathing and toileting. And for some people, the thought of bringing a stranger in to help them with some of the most intimate of activities is a little challenging or overwhelming. What advice can you offer, Mark, to help someone accept care from a caregiver so they're not embarrassed or uncomfortable? Well, one of the things, when I first hired my agency, the director came out to my house. We sat down and talked over my needs and what the caregivers would be doing. And he asked me, now you're a man, so are you going to want a woman or a man caregiver or don't you care? And I said, I actually don't really care. I don't think I'll be uncomfortable or with either. He said, because to be honest, I have a lot more women caregivers than men on my staff. And I said, 
that's fine. I'll I'll do either. So I've pretty much had female caregivers for 90% of my care. They bathe me. They help me in the bathroom. And they've all been great. I actually found that it only took a couple days to get used to a stranger coming into my home. The first time, maybe a week, and by the first day of the second week, I didn't think anything of it anymore. And now we're doing my bath, we're working in the bathroom, and we're talking and we're laughing. It's just like we do when I'm having breakfast. It doesn't matter. I'm just totally comfortable with it. And I really, I'm not embarrassed. I don't think anything of it anymore. It's just kind of a routine we've kind of flowed into. And I'd say it's, it feels weird for the first day and you're going to get used to it really quick. So I've had a great experience. Liz, do you have anything to add? Well, as a female who has had a baby, your modesty goes out the window once you have had a child. So it wasn't that much of an adjustment to have someone help with some of the things that most people don't want to have to have help with. But um, at the end of the day, when you realize how much time you're going to save by having assistance and how much better your day flows and how much more energy that you have, I think that all those worries just go away. And, you know, again, everybody does it, you know, everybody has to get ready, everybody has to use the bathroom, take a shower. So it's not like we're doing something that no one else does. Very true. When we bring someone to the house, um, I think that safety needs to be a priority for um, the patient as well as the caregiver. Um, we don't want to be injured and we don't want our caregivers to get injured either. Since we often require physical assistance, especially when it comes to getting in and out of bed or transferring, is there anything that you do that can help the process be safer for you and your caregiver? Andrew, do you have anything that you sure. can do? Yeah, I'll, I'll go through uh, a couple of examples. And I think to me as the condition kind of develops you've always got to look to the future and be that one step ahead of the game looking for things that can go wrong uh, and then being very open and honest with, with the caregiver so i used to do a type of half stand where somebody would support me from behind i would throw myself and then they would lift me into this position i'd lock my legs i'd be completely bent over and then they could quickly pull the trousers up or the pants up uh, and and down and then transfer onto a commode or between wheelchair now as things progressed that became more difficult and it was identifying that eventually this is going to go wrong and it's either going to be the timing's not going to go right or uh, my legs are going to slip or something's going to happen so being ready for that next stage getting a hoist ready getting trained in a hoist even before i needed it even though the hoist was in the cupboard and i was very fearful as to what that meant because it was a big step to move to but the second i started to feel uncomfortable that was it we stopped doing that maneuver um, at the moment, my arms are very weak, uh, and as I'm sat up from the bed, um, the caregiver would lift, lift me by the arm into a sitting up position. We've always done it that way. It's just it's much easier than other ways of doing it. It's nice and quick, um, but manual handling for them, bending over, using their back. Um, so we've identified other ways. We've got uh, healthcare professionals, such as physiotherapists, to come in, see how we're doing it, to protect my shoulder from being pulled out of its socket, but also the caregiver from injuring their back. Uh, I've now got a profiling bed, which sits me up probably 85%, and then the caregiver can just lift me the rest of the way. So I think always being mindful as what's next with LGMD. There's always a nice little surprise for us around the corner, uh, and then trying to plan ahead for that. That, that's a wonderful idea to bring in um, physical therapy or occupational therapy to help assess the situation and help it to be more um, a much more safer activity for both of you. And is there anything that you do in your setting? I know um, injury is always a concern. I uh, yes, we our house is um, small, so we practice with the. Hoyer lift. 
just to see it. And it just didn't work right for us because I've got carpeting and tile and transitioning and all of that. So what we did was we got a ceiling lift in our bedroom and the bathroom. And so that, that was something, um, my goal was to make it easier for my husband as well as easier for someone else to help me. Um, I do have a caregiver who can lift me, but it's, I wanted to make it so anybody could help me. So anyway, we did a, a, a overhead lift and we have, we also got a bed that will sit me up to avoid what Andrew mentioned, problems with the shoulders or the, the caregivers bending over and such. So the, the bed will sit me up, the overhead lift can get me out of bed. Um, we also have a roll-in shower that we added years and years ago because we knew what was coming and thought that that would be a good idea. Um, we have a rolling shower and uh, a, a rolling shower chair. So between all those things that really provides it so that someone else can help me and they don't have to be really strong. And if my husband's helping me, he's not going to get hurt and they're not going to get hurt. And also, I'm not going to get hurt. <laughs> um, equipment can make all the difference without a doubt. So I think all of us probably have our own little collection of durable medical equipment mm -hmm. that becomes vital in our life. And even if we travel, it goes with us because it's just part of our daily routine. I'm wondering, when you depend on a caregiver for activities of da daily living, we all know that it's important that you can depend upon them, but it's also vital that you have an emergency backup plan. How do you manage when a caregiver um, doesn't show up, takes time off, or you encounter an emergency? I think that this is something that all of us need to um, prepare for. So Mark, what is your backup plan? Well, because I'm with an agency, they've got a great backup plan. I don't even usually, theoretically, I don't need to get involved. If a caregiver wakes up and is sick or has car trouble, they call the office and the office sends a backup. And right now we have got the first backup would be, I have different caregivers, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then a different caregiver, Tuesday, Thursday. So the first backup is the caregiver that would not have come that day. The second backup is another staff at the office. And if neither of those works out, either the office manager, who's a male nurse, he's been to my house to meet me and evaluate the house and me he would come and the last resort is the owner himself the director he'll come he's actually been to my house twice on days when he couldn't get a backup so i've since i've had the agency i've never once been left in bed it happened a few times when i had the family friend come i was in bed till five o'clock because he had car trouble and couldn't get here but with the agency, I'm fortunate. I've never had a situation where a I can't get a backup. That's wonderful. How about you, Andrew? Your backup plan? Yeah, it's the, it's the thing you kind of plan for and you really hope will never happen. Uh, I've got family that live very close. My, my brother uh, lives only five minutes away. But um, I found I, I employ my caregivers directly. And the way that I've kind of developed a, a backup plan over the years is is perhaps to involve them in a lot of my life. Um, so take them on holidays and um, really try and uh, it, develop a very firm bond with a caregiver. And it's, it's not always possible because people do change jobs, but I'm very lucky I've got people that have worked for me for a very long time. So when something goes wrong, and I've got something going wrong at the moment. And it's it's very it, it heartwarming just how the caregivers have kind of swarmed around me 
to look after me uh, and I really kind of feel that that's been building up for a long time uh, and it's kind of a, that symbiotic relationship um, they work with me and I try and make the job as interesting as possible um, but they're there for me when the chips are down uh, and uh, and family which is crucial uh, living close to a family member is a, a, a huge benefit. Liz what type of backup plan do you use? So my situation is very similar to Andrew's as far as I have um, personal assistance that I seek out on my own instead of using an agency. And so these people do become your family and friends. And I also have family and friends that are very close um, to me. So I have tons of backup that could be here in a moment's notice. And I also have um, an individual that lives above my garage in an apartment. So it's kind of a 24 seven backup, but in the case that, you know, they are not home, there are still people that are, you know, less than 30 seconds away that can come. Wonderful. Ann, do you have any other backup ideas? Uh, what I do is I have an agency. Um, one of the agencies can't provide a backup, but I do have, I've spoken with my family about this and I have a couple of sister-in-laws that can jump in at a moment's notice for emergencies. And then with the other caregiver agencies, they have, care, they have backups that they can provide um, if th there's different levels of emergencies. So if it's a no show, uh, my husband can help. So we, I think we have it all covered. Um, hopefully it's hard to come up with every situation, but I think we've got it covered with those things. At least knowing a backup plan, I think is just crucial. Um, Obviously, it's always put to test in that emergency situation, but thinking ahead and planning just in case is really important. So you're not like Mark and stuck in bed till five in the afternoon when someone um, comes home. As, you, as we've been discussing, some of the individuals um, prefer to use an agency, and some prefer to hire direct. What are some of the pros and cons of using an agency? I know, Mark, um, you use an agency for your caregivers. What are some of the pros and cons? Pros and cons is you've got strangers coming, obviously, and there is a high turnover. My very first caregiver is still with me after four years. And all the others I've seen come and go, they've lasted anywhere from six months to a year. So with an agency, you do have to get used to strangers coming into your home. Of course, there's always a trust issue. I've never had an issue whatsoever about being able to trust any of my caregivers from this agency. So I've been really fortunate with that. Um, other, and you never know, and they are going to other clients' houses too. Some of, these, some of these caregivers have four or five different clients and they may get tied up at the other client's house and, and stuff like that. But other than that, I've, there aren't too many cons about having that agency. I've been really happy with it. I've never really had a, you know, I've never hired on my own outside of an agency other than having this family friend do it for a few months. And so I've just been really fortunate. So with the agency. Is there anything in that sticks out to you as a pro or a con of using an agency? Yes, I, I've used both individual and through agencies. And some of the benefits that I prefer are that the agency does the background check and they also check their credentials. So the agency has certain 
things that they require of those of those caregivers. And they also require, I'm not sure if it's the state or the company requires it, but there's continued education. So I know that each caregiver has had certain training and they, they're doing continuing education. And the agency um, has safety policies in place. So that really came out with COVID. Um, the, we all don't want to get sick. So, but it, it was good because the agents, the particular agency that I was working with was on top of it, making sure that their caregivers are, are healthy and put protocols in place. So that made me feel comfortable that I didn't really have to worry about that, that they were covering it on their end. Um, so th the fact that they're protecting them, then I just have to worry about me. So that lifted a lot out of it. And the, the cons of it are that different agencies have these minimums. So some of them I could get for three hours, some of them four. Um, one of my agencies, the reason I don't have a backup is her. They don't have any more to do short terms. They only do long. So that's a con. So even though I've been with that agency a long time, they've changed over time and require like a 12 hour shift or an eight hour shift. And I just can't do that. So that's a bit of a con. The yeah. other option that many individuals choose is to hire direct. Um, they seek their caregivers through a number of community resources. Liz, you are someone who hires direct. Can you share a little bit about how you search for a caregiver? So initially, um, I was looking for a nanny to help with my daughter. And so my, my sister and my mom reached out to their friends and their friends. And so it ended up being a friend of my sister. It was her mother-in-law. And so I think that as far as hiring direct, when it is someone that you know, you have the added benefit of kind of already knowing most of their background and the fact that you feel comfortable with them and, you know, what they will be helping you with. And then for me, um, with both of the caregivers, the nanny and my new caregiver, um, they can help with my daughter if need be. They can pick her up from school. They can, you know, watch her if I have a meeting at work or something. And so I don't know that that's something that an agency would allow to happen. I would think that the care would have to be given to, you know, actually the patient and not the patient's child. Um, but as far as the cons go, I assume that it's very hard to be a caregiver and some days it's very hard to be a patient who needs the care. And so something that I feel very important, very strongly about is open communication, that if there's ever an issue or something that comes up that, you know, whether it's something I don't like or something the caregiver doesn't like, that that's something that we go ahead and address immediately so that it doesn't cause a problem or irreversible damage to our relationship. Andrew, I believe you also hire some of your caregivers. Um, what is your experience and how do you search for your caregivers and what are some of the pros and cons that you've experienced? Uh, sure. So I think um, everyone will agree you get a decent caregiver. They're like gold dust and you uh, hang on to them for as long as possible. But how do you find them? Uh, and uh, in the past, I have had agency carers and I've met one that uh, has stood out and shone above the rest. And then when you've met them a few times and you have that conversation, and agencies don't like you approaching people directly. There's normally a fee or, or it's just not a done thing. Um, but quite often the caregivers would prefer to be employed directly because they can earn more money. Uh, and I think the agency charges twice what they pay the carer. So, um, and that's certainly how I've found someone who's been with me now 10 years. Um, 
but other than that i, I have recruited and, and similar to bliss um it was uh, a bit like an au pair that comes from overseas uh, or a nanny and um uh, but there was part of a volunteer program where carers come from Europe over to the UK um, to have a gap year before going off to university. And I found those caregivers can suddenly be incredibly motivated to make the best out of their, their gap year. They're there because they care, but they're there also to experience life in the UK. And as long as you've got that, that relationship, and a bit like Bliss said, being very, very open and honest and saying, right, you're here for 10 months, I'm going to make this as the best time that I can, but in return, this, this and this needs to happen because this is my life. Um, and, you know, if I ask you to do something and you go, oh, I'm not doing that <laughs> because you're a teenager, um, then, you know, that's not always acceptable. Um, I might laugh and joke and go and do it myself or get my son to help me. But there's times when I just need extra assistance. So it's a, it, there's so many pros and cons, but I think just that little nugget if you find the right person no matter what background they're from or where they're from you grab them with both arms you hang on to them you text them all the time you're a wonderful caregiver thank you very much you buy them birthday presents gifts anything possible to keep that person um because they're, they're so important and can make a huge difference it's not uncommon um to have more than one caregiver who is coming in because obviously we usually need assistance seven days out of the week and it's hard to get that um, from one individual. So, Anne, how do you manage delegating and coordinating tasks when you routinely have more than one caregiver coming into your home? I have a core set of things that need to be done. And then beyond that, it changes all the time. And each caregiver has their own um, strengths and weaknesses. And some of them are better at one thing than something else. And so I try to take advantage of that, that it usually balances out where some of them are good at cooking and some of them aren't, or some of them like to clean, some don't. So I, I try to balance that out. Um, but most of all, I think of it as an extension of me. And so each time that they come, besides the basic core things, it's whatever I need for that day. And I think they like it. I think they like having different things and not the same thing every time. Mark, do you, Mark I believe you have more than one caregiver in your home at times. Typically, I have two during the week, and when I first hired mine, I typed up a sheet, and I actually labeled it Mark's Expectations, and I have certain categories. The first would be on a daily basis, get me out of bed, get me dressed, do my bath, help me in the bathroom, fix my breakfast, things like that that have to be done every day. And then below that, I've got like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, wash my hair. And then I have on Fridays, I'd like my sheets washed. Once a week, I'd like my wheelchair cleaned and dusted. And, and, and then the very last category, I've got occasional things I'll ask you to do. And that's like open mail or help me move things or help me, you know, adjust my drawers in my closet. And whenever somebody starts, that's the first thing I show them is that sheet. And I, the, the, my agency actually has a checklist, too, that they've given me. And I just make copies of that every week. And the caregivers just check everything off. I highlight it with yellow marker, the ones that I want done every day. And they just go down and check that off and sign it on Friday. So uh, we, and it keeps track of their hours and the days they were here too. So um, that, like, my, that system's worked out really well. Sounds like a great setup. I know that our needs exist as we all do, no matter if we're at home or we're traveling. Um, sometimes individuals will use 
their caregiver mm -hmm. when they're at work or on vacation. Andrew, I think you travel occasionally with your caregiver. How do you compensate a caregiver when they're outside of the home? Difficult because it can be very expensive if they're going to be with you um, for a day and overnight and then or, or even a whole week. So I, I think I would have because I have different caregivers. I would say I've got this trip that I'm planning. Is it something that you'd like to do? Uh, and if I get buy in, that's great, because then I can discuss it with them and say, well, you're going to be part of this holiday uh, and I might cover your food um, within reason. Um, but I can only pay you your normal rate. Um, so I'll cover your airfare and, and I'll cover your travel expenses. Um, but when you're away with me, um, I can't be paying you 24 hours a day because it's, it's not always affordable. Uh, and it's having that relationship with someone and that it then becomes partially their holiday. And when that happens, it can be difficult. And I remember being on holiday over in the States, um, traveling over to DC and um, the caregiver wanted to put me to bed and then go out drinking. Um, and of course, that's such a difficult conversation to have because I'm like, well, okay, but then I'm in the hotel. If it's just a hotel bar, I don't, I don't mind. And then I find out he's been out clubbing and all sorts of things. Well, lucky you didn't get arrested because <laughs> I'd be stuck in the in the hotel. And that has happened to people that I've heard of, not me, thankfully. Um, but it, it's having that relationship where if it's a really big trip, I can say, you know, I'll, I'll take you on this trip. Um, and it can be partially your trip as well um, because you do become very close and you can become very good friends with a caregiver. But that's when the lines sometimes get blurred and you think well actually this is my holiday i'm i'm paying for it um and i need someone to help me not go and get drunk because that's what they want to do on their holiday um or sometimes you feel almost like you're being put to bed uh, hello i don't want to be put to bed you know i want to go out and with the lads and, and have a good time or, or just you know experience part of the holiday but it's having that understanding that actually that that person needs some downtime as well um and if that is uh, acceptable it still wasn't for me, and I still find that very, very awkward that someone's left the hotel to go out and having a good time, but um, nothing bad happened. I had a great holiday, and we came back. We're still friends, and we'll do another holiday again. Liz, you've had some experience traveling with a caregiver. Is it fairly similar to Robert's or Andrew's? Yes, it is very similar. Um, a conversation was had on the front end about whether travel was something that they would be interested in or not. And then again, you know, you're, we, I do the same as far as paying the normal rate and then also travel expenses as far as hotel accommodations and meals. And then there's downtime as well during the vacation so that they're not working 24-7. As we start to wind down this session, I'm wondering if there's any helpful tips or advice that you can offer to individuals who might be considering a caregiver that maybe we didn't discuss today. Mark? Well, all I can say is plan ahead. Don't wait until it's too late. I almost did that. I couldn't get out of bed a couple of times. So start planning ahead when you know the day is coming, you're going to have to hire. And I also want everybody to know that it's really not as awkward as you think it might be having this person come into your home. You actually end up becoming friends with them and it's, it gets really comfy really fast. By the third or fourth day, you're just falling into a routine and you wonder why you hadn't done it a year or two ago. Annie? Um, some things that I think of are uh, to be clear about what you actually need and what's optional. So make sure that they know, like, no, this is not acceptable or this is, it's okay. I can work with that. Um, and just figure out ahead of time what you can do if they can't make it, like, I do know if, like, I recently had a caregiver call in sick, like, half an hour before she was supposed to be there. So I've experienced that before. So, so I know how I'll react and I know what I'm going to do. Um, so I'm prepared for it. 
So being prepared really, really helps. And they aren't going to know, you know, each client is different and how you react and how some other client reacts will be totally different. So just make it clear as, as to how you feel. But one thing I've learned from the various caregivers I've had is that it's fascinating to hear their story. I've had caregivers from other countries and they're just amazing people and listen to their story. It's, it's just a really great experience. And I think it's improved my life and just helped me to have a full life, to have that contact. How about you, Bliss? Is there a tip or advice that you have? Don't delay. Go ahead and get a personal care assistant, even if you don't think that you need them. A long time ago, I got myself in an emergency type situation as far as being able to get in and out of my vehicle. And from that moment on, I promised myself that I would never get in an emergency situation again, that I would always be forward thinking with a progressive disability. You know that things are eventually going to get worse and don't wait for them to get worse before you have a plan together. And you will still be independent and you will still be successful, even if you have to have a little help. And Andrew, any um, closing tips or advice that you can offer? I think two things. Firstly, is don't underestimate the impact it has on other people in the house um, because other people um, are sharing their space. And, and that in itself can be quite negative at times. Um, it can be positive because it it's something that perhaps they uh, that they've been doing for you for a long time. But it's also um, somebody else coming into the house and doing household chores. Uh, and, and, and that can have a negative impact, especially on relationships. Um, on the positive side of things, what I like to do with my caregivers is to introduce them to each other. Um, so we might have a couple of times a year, we all go out for a meal and they get to meet each other. And then I have a shared space uh, on Google Docs where we can see the shift patterns. So if one of them needs to swap a shift, they feel comfortable to talk to each other. Um, and then you've got a good relationship between them. So hopefully if one of them is phoning in sick, they'll have spoken to other people before they'll tell me and then it's covered. Um, but yeah, get, getting them together a couple of times a year just for a meal or a drink or something, um, just showing that appreciation, but also getting them bonding with each other. And they can always bond by horror stories about things that I've done, if, it, if it's a smelly <laughs> armpits or, you know, anything like way. Um, uh, there's lots of common ground. Well, I want to thank everyone who attended this session today. Um, we hope that you found it beneficial that the experiences we shared um, can help you and your family member um, accept a caregiver in your home and to navigate the system a little bit better. I especially want to thank our panel for sharing their caregiver experience today. Um, we know that caregiver resources and services may vary depending on where you live, but we hope that you have a little bit better understanding about utilizing a caregiver in your home to assist you or a family member, and that it is something that you will not be afraid um, to explore because a caregiver truly can make such a huge difference in our lives, especially as our disease continues to progress. And we want to maintain our. Um, active lifestyle and our independence. And sometimes, um, you know, we just need the help of someone else. So um, thank you for joining us today. And thank you to our panelists. You, I think you did a great job. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for being with us for day one of our 2021 International LGMD Conference. We want to thank our platinum sponsors, Sarepta Therapeutics, AskBio, and GFB Onless. Join us first thing tomorrow morning at 11.30 a.m. Eastern as we learn more about the basics of gene therapy from Sarepta Therapeutics. Sarepta will also share important updates with our community on their pipeline for limb girdle muscular dystrophy gene therapy. 
Remember, our community chats begin in just a little bit at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. If you're an individual or family member living with Limb Girdle, you are invited to participate. To access the link for the chats, see your conference program, or go to our conference website. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow for day two of our International LGMD Conference.